so <laughs> I just did the reporting. But somebody else did all of the magic. And today, MG, MJ Lee from the Preparedness Wildfire Committee is uh, manning our computers and our sound system and will be monitoring questions if we have any that come in online. But once again, are we okay, MJ? Okay, we're ready. Good morning again. Happy Earth Day. Thank you for spending it with us. And I am Rita Williams. I didn't know there was a slide that had that on there. The picture is uh, about 10 years old. So uh, I've aged a little. I'm retired now. You see the credentials as a reporter. But I think that the most important thing that was left off there is that I'm a resident. And I am facing all the same issues that you are. And I think we're all in this together. And I hope that this morning will be that we share as a community and how we can help each other through what will be, could be, some very uh, big problems with insurance especially. And um, not only that, I have a son who has been representing fire victims for the last five years in their lawsuits against PG&E. So I know a lot about the subject and a lot about what fire victims have experienced as well as reporting uh, wildfires through that 40 plus years and being actually stuck and having to man hoses at times because we were in danger with firefighters. So um, there's just a lot here. And we are thrilled today that Julia Juarez is with us. And Julia is the head of the um, Community Relations and Outreach Branch of the Department of Insurance for the state of California. And she's been with them four years, the time the commissioner, um, help me with his first name, Laura, Ricardo Laura, took over about four years ago. And you know all the disasters that have hit the state since then. And I think it's so important today because I'm sure you're all aware and probably why you're here is that insurance is a new regulation that took effect in January of this year. And for the first time, the commissioner, uh, for, it's actually the first in the country to try to um, have insurance companies look at mitigation that you're doing on your homes and your businesses and how that can affect your insurance rates. And if you wanna know, I'm sure she will tell you more about it, but where we are in the process just this last week, the insurance companies had to submit their new rates based on different criteria. If you home harden your house for this or that or whatever, and they're still going through those, she'll tell you about what will happen next, but that will affect probably all of our rates. And in the meantime, independent of the insurance company is that we're all waiting on the state fire maps and where we fall here in Portola Valley and Woodside for um, whether we're deemed to be higher risk or what. So a lot of things are gonna affect our insurance very soon. And some of us have already been affected and many of you had uh, policies canceled or now part of the care plan, care, care plan that the state offers. So anyway, with that introduction, uh, here is Julia Juarez, and we appreciate again your being here. And she came up from LA just for this. I hate that even more. You get some beauty of Northern oh California. <laughs> it, is, it is absolutely gorgeous. It sounds like it to come up and just Good. here. So thank you, thank you for uh, Pleasure to, to be here with you today. I would like to share um, the screen. Okay. I'm not sure why we're getting all of this. You don't come in here a lot. It comes and goes. Maybe. I'm on my back. Maybe okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, what's this mean? Can you hear me better? 
All right. So, uh, does that make it louder? Hello? Can you hear me better? Louder? All right. Okay, good. So we are, uh, we're good. So I am, um, I'm delighted to be here with you this morning uh, and talk to you about what the Department of Insurance is doing uh, throughout the state. Um, the issue of uh, homeowners insurance, uh, the issue of availability and affordability uh, is a very big issue that we have been dealing with uh, for the past four years. Um, so I am, uh, I'm here, I'm happy to be here to talk to you a little bit about what we have been doing to, um, to, to deal with this. Um, as uh, one of the very first things Commissioner Lara did as uh, when he got elected was uh, he went up, up and down the state uh, and met with uh, a lot of communities and uh, many communities about what were the biggest issues that they were facing and what, and what was it that we needed to do to address them. And of course, homeowners insurance and availability and non-renewals start, were starting to make be a big, big issue then. Um, so what the commissioner did was gathered all of the agencies that actually deal with uh, wildfires and, uh, and, and working with any type of issue around wildfires and uh, brought them all together. And they basically got them all in the room and said, let's try to figure out what can we come up with that we can uh, give the consumer very specific things that consumers can do so that we can mitigate this, uh, this risk, you know, lower the risk. Because what we're hearing from insurance companies is, and as I'm sure you have heard, uh, insurance companies don't really care that you have been paying your insurance for 30 years or 40 years or never had a, a claim. What they look at is the previous few years of what their losses are. And so 2018 saw the biggest loss uh, in the state in, in, in history uh, with the, the wildfires then. And then the next year we had we saw some wildfires again and all and so then they lost a lot of money and, and, and you know had to uh, had to do a lot of you know a lot of work to make sure that everyone uh, was able to uh, to to either rebuild or, or you know, uh, basically be covered. So because of that, then insurance companies started looking at their books and saying, what can I do to minimize my risk, right? So of course, the very first thing is get rid of all the folks that are in my fire, wildfire zones, or you know, either get, get rid of them or make it so almost impossible for them to, to, uh, to afford to, to get this insurance. So that was, that was their, their tactic. Now, the wonderful thing about uh, that, that the commissioner had done before this, right before when he was in the Senate, was um, he actually wrote a bill that uh, made it uh, illegal, basically, for insurance companies to drop people right after a wildfire or drop the people who had, who either were victims of wildfire or who were uh, you know, in the surrounding area of a wildfire. Uh, so I'm very happy to report that for the last four years or so, we have had, uh, you know, we have been able to allow people to have at least one year for them to look at their, you know, look at their policies and try to find, you know, find other ways to make sure that they're covered. Um, if they're not, you know, if, if they're looking at their insurance company and thinking this insurance, this insurance is going gonna, is gonna to try to bail, right? So people had the opportunity to have a whole year of, you know, making sure that they, they took care of what they needed to. But also those folks that had losses, for them to not think about trying to get new insurance, but actually try to get themselves together, you know, so that was um, what, you know, and what has happened since then, we have had about 4 million homes that have been, um, that have had that, uh, that safety net at that point. So at least, you know, we were able to stop the bleeding, you know, at the, at the very, very beginning. But um, what, so then what the commissioner did was once we got everyone together, they put together this framework, the Safer from Wildfires framework, which I'm sure if you were part of one of the, you know, local fire safe consoles or firewise communities, you're pretty familiar with it already. 
but it's very basic, protecting your home or business, protecting the immediate surroundings of your, of your home, and then protecting the entire community. The idea of building this and having all of these agencies come together was to actually have one thing that we can very much so point to and say, if we do these things, we will minimize our risk and insurance companies were part of that conversation. We had hearings and uh, lots, of, lots of, uh, of, of conversations with community members and, uh, and, and you know, these organizations to make sure that these things were, you know, were feasible and were also the things that would bring down the risk, which ultimately is what insurance companies are telling us that they need to, you know, to, to mitigate, right? So with that, it is very, you know, these, these are the very specific things and there's six things for your home, you know, there that, that you can actually, you know, you know uh, check out, <laughs> you know, basically it's like, it's like, you know, your, your roof, your, uh, your, your zone, your, you know, your, your immediate area surrounding, you know, your, your home, making sure that there's, uh, that your vents are, ember and fire resistant. And then of course, you know, double pane windows uh, and, you know, and enclosed eaves, you would be surprised of how many homes, uh, you know, that had were nowhere near a wild, the wildfire, you know, caught on fire because something, something just happened to fly in and went into their, their attic. And then everything went, you know, went, went from there. So those are, those are very specific things that a home can do. The immediate surroundings, it's, very, it's also three very specific things. Clear the vegetation and debris surrounding decks, uh, sheds and, uh, and, and outbuildings, at least, you know, have them at least 30 feet away, trim trees uh, so, and remove the brush so that there, you know, there's, there, there's space between your home and, uh, and, and, and those, uh, those things that can catch fire. And then the last thing, which is the, a very important thing, is really working with your whole community because it doesn't matter how much you do to save, to have your home as mitigated as possible and, 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 and well taken care of, if your neighbor has all kinds of stuff around and they catch fire, then that might, you know, might be easier for you to get, right? So, what, what this is, is basically an opportunity and, and uh, an idea of having people work together to get entire communities to be in the same page. And if we have, you know, if there are certain people who might not be able to do, to, you know, to do something simple uh, in their home, but a community can notice and say, okay, that needs to be done. You can't do it because maybe they're disabled or you know, there's something. The community can come in and help and make that happen together. But the idea is then if the entire community then does this, then we are able to have, be safer. And then you know, wildfires won't be able to, um, to, to get to us as easily, right? Then what uh, in the idea behind all of this is that once you, you have those things, then your, your insurance should be able to come down. You should be able to qualify for a discount. So there are, those are the very specific things. And all of this, you can also see in our website, which is very simple. It's just insurance.ca.gov. So, uh, and so there you can, you know, you will be able to see all of this. We're also going to have some, uh, some forms out in, uh, out in the, the, the general area as well that has all of this information. But um, one, you know, so what we wanna do is make sure that we are partnering with you to make this happen. The regulation that the commissioner did, because it wasn't that once this got done with these organizations, the commissioner then got, um, then got the, let me try to get back. Sorry. Oh, 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 so sorry. Um, I'm coming back to to the one that you that you all were looking at and making notes on. There we are. Okay. So what we came, what the commissioner did after this was once these organizations all adopted this, 
I want every, you know, everyone in the state, or the, the government agencies adopted all of this, then this, there was this regulation for insurance companies. And insurance companies were given the opportunity to be a part of the, the conversation, to be a part of, of, of all of this. And as, uh, you know, as, as you were informed, uh, they now have to, it's part of a regulation that they have to turn in their new uh, ratings uh, so that we can look at it and see how are you going to incorporate all of this into your rates for consumers. So consumers now will have the opportunity to, you know, once you do all of these things, you're able to contact your insurance company and see, okay, how, you know, how, work with me to see if I, you know, if, if I can get any savings from this, right? But besides getting the savings, the idea behind all this is very much so working with your local communities so that overall, the insurance industry as a whole is able to then look at this stuff and then say, okay, sky isn't falling. We're not, you know, this is, it's, it, it's, we can, we can continue to, uh, to sell insurance. Unfortunately, the commissioner does not have the authority to compel or uh, make <laughs> in any way, shape or form, make insurance companies sell insurance, right? But what we can do is come up with ways to engage the, the, the industry. One of the things that we keep hearing from people uh, and, and you know, when we are out in, in the community is um, insurance companies are telling us that they're going to leave the state because you know, we're, they, they're not able to charge enough, right? That's, that's a big thing that, they, that they, they say. Here's the thing, California is the biggest insurance market in the entire United States and the fourth largest in the, in the world. Insurance companies are going nowhere. No insurance company has left the state. They might be changing the way that they do business. You might have heard of, of companies, you know, saying, oh, we're gonna shut down our, our, uh, our offices. Yeah, but now we do everything online. <laughs> so it doesn't matter they're shutting down their office, they can still sell insurance online. So there's, you know, so, so in a sense, don't think that this is what's happening, that insurance companies are leaving the state. They're not. There is too much money to be made in California for insurance companies to, to do that. Now, what, what the commissioner and the department as the, um, as the regulator of the insurance industry what we have to do is very much so, you know, walk that line, making sure that insurance companies are able to, um, to charge what they need to so that when there is a fire or any type of catastrophe, they are able to pay out the, um, the claims. So, that, so there is that. But the other part of this is we need to make absolutely sure that consumers are protected that consumers are able to that um, are able to pay pay those premiums, and that uh, that what they're charging is not discriminatory or in any way, shape, or form taken advantage of the consumer. So those are the things that we look at. So right now, all of the uh, all of the uh, the insurance companies had until April twelfth to turn in all the, their new rate filings, and so. We are now with the next, the next 47 days, we're reviewing all of their rate filings and making sure that they are appropriate, that they are, they are going to do what they said they're going to do, that, they're, that what they're saying in their paperwork is what, is, is what actuarially uh, makes sense, that it's sound, that basically, you know, comparing apples to apples and not, you know, not, not, not different, you know, different things that, that insurance companies might throw in there. So we do have a very rigorous um, uh, you know, set of rules that we have to follow to make absolutely sure that insurance companies are doing this correctly. And so that is happening right now. We have, uh, like I said, we have about 47 days or so to, um, to, to you know, ask questions, make sure that we have everything in line. As insurance companies bring, you know, send in their stuff, you know, if some of them had already knowing that this was coming, 
uh, from the time that we started doing this, we had about nine insurance companies um, that were that started doing uh, that, that started doing some type of mitigation discount. Um, by the time you know the the regulation actually went into effect uh, in January, we actually had about forty percent of the market already coming into you know doing doing some type of of, uh, of of plan already of you know work with the communities already. Um, so the expectation is that now you will be able to to have uh, to you know to have the opportunity to get a discount. The other very important thing uh, that is a part of this as well is that every single person that has you know has an insurance, they have to the insurance companies in the past will tell you your wildfire risk score is 150. I don't know, you know, like just say, you know, it's, it's something really high. Um, and so you would ask the insurance company, how did you come to that? How did you, how, you know, what is that? Tell me what is, what is all this? And they would say to you, that's proprietary information. So of course we can't share that with you. So, so you as a consumer were out of, you know, out of luck because you had no idea what, what, what are you saying? What are you, what are you actually looking at? So now part of this regulation is that they have to show you what your fire risk score is and review it with you and tell you why is it that they're, they're rating you in that, uh, in that score. And if you don't agree, if you feel like, you know what? No, I have done all of these things and that doesn't make sense you now have the right to dispute that and have that, you know, be able to have that conversation with the insurance company. If you are, you know, you, you again, you know, you do that and insurance company is, is not budging or there is, you're not, you know, you guys are not communicating well, um, the Department of Insurance is going to be available for you, for you to contact us and we are able to then be, you know, be the, the, the go-between and work with you both to make sure that you are getting the rate that you deserve. So those are the, those are the big things that are, uh, that are happening with this regulation that we have never had before. It is the first in the country, and it is something that other states are now looking at to see if they can, uh, they can actually you know, imitate in some way because the insurance companies are all coming to terms with, okay, how do we, how do we work together to make this happen? Um, I hope that you all had a chance to do all, you know, to look at this and so we can move to the next. Just wanted to make sure that you knew we are working with your local leaders. Um, you know, like today that I'm, I'm here with you. We have been since 2019, all, all over the state, have met with about 150,000 people through 875 virtual and in-person meetings and events and, you know, throughout all of the counties of the state. And one of the things that we want to make sure of is that we continue to have that conversation with you. That if this is not, you know, if, if you're not, you know, getting the support that you need, that you know how to get a hold of us, that we can, we can partner with you and try to find solutions to these issues. Um, the, the outreach team, every week, we have a listing of all the different things that we're, that, you know, that we're doing that we put on social media. So that if you are part of a firewise community or you know uh, uh, any type of, of group that is doing mitigation work and that kind of thing, and you want to, um, you know, you you want to have information from the department, you want to have someone from the department there with you, we are happy to connect with you. We have uh, staff throughout the state that is very much so dedicated to coming in and working with you. Locally, here we have our, our liaison is Mary Beth Baikowski, who was supposed to be here today, but unfortunately her husband caught COVID and I did not want her to, um, you know, infect anyone. So, uh, we, uh, so, so that's, uh, that's why she unfortunately is not here with us today. However, I want to make sure that you all know that there is someone from the Department of Insurance that is going to be available that you can reach out to, you know, as you're talking to your neighbors and doing you know, doing this type of work. Besides that, the Department of Insurance has, we will, through your colleagues, through, you know, through the organizations that you might be working with, 
we also are able to do to write support letters when you all are applying for grants. There is uh, the you know the commissioner has been very very much so in the forefront, making absolutely sure that money becomes available to local communities for this work out in the community, out in out in, in you know in, in prior prevention, education, planning, any type of um, assistance. You know some people have done. Uh, the chipper programs, others have uh, have done, um, th there was a community that actually purchased uh, those vents, uh, you know, fire resistant vents and had them passed around to every single house in their neighborhood. So those are the types of things, you know, that, that you as a community can come together and figure out how can we, you know, how, how, can, how can we help everyone make sure that we're all doing our best to be safer. And so that type of thing, we are happy to write letters of support for you as you are applying for these grants. Um, and so, you know, we are, uh, th that's another part of, of, um, of the work that we're doing. And then um, we wanna make sure that you know how to get a hold of us because we have our 800 number is, uh, is based, it's, you know, office hours for government. 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., uh, but it is very much so. We are available. We do not have a wait time. Um, if by any chance you happen to catch us when there's a bunch of calls and people, and, and, and you know, you might go into um, into a voicemail, we return a call within one minute. Our agency is is absolutely on it, and you will not be speaking to a machine. You will be speaking to a person. Uh, and they will, they, and these folks are uh, insurance experts that are able to review your policy with you, are able to go through, um, you know, what, you know, what are the, the issues that you might be having and how can we, you know, how can we help if there is a way that, you know, they look at things, you know, and, and go through, you know, fine tooth comb to try to make sure that, you know, what, what the insurance company is offering you or is saying that, that that's correct that that is in line with what they're supposed to be doing. So we are absolutely available for you. Another part of this is we want to make sure, and I was, I was just sharing, that we do have, um, you know, when, when people are doing this work, sometimes you do hire folks that come by to communities and, you know, are, are saying, oh, we can, you know, we can help do this or that. You know, we are also able to help you make sure that you, know, you can check people's licenses Make sure that you know your whoever you're dealing with uh, is is legitimate, and um, and we also have uh, you know uh, 300 sworn police officers, sworn officers, not police officers, but sworn officers, uh, who are part of the Department of Insurance, who are always uh, also uh, investigating fraud and scams. Uh, so if you happen to you know if you know uh, or, or happen to be um, uh, you know a victim of any of that, we are available also to just go and investigate those uh, those things and, and, and make sure that we're able to help. So those are the things that we are we have available for you and we want to be a partner with you. Um, and at this point, I'm available for answers. So for questions, yeah. answer any we questions. We hope you're you available have. for the answers. <laughs> We've got questions. Uh, I know we, may, we had some pre-questions that folks sent in this week. Um, so, but I want to go to those of you who have made the effort to come here today. And because they want this recorded, uh, you have to ask your questions on mic, I'm afraid. So, is it, well, it's up at the podium. Well, or, no. Just go to one of those little mics. <laughs> to get this one. Go to where? Just go, uh, go to the chair. You can pick it up if you don't want to sit down and just hold it. And tell us your name as well, please. Good morning. My name is Hank Stern. I live on Skyline at the McKinney Mountain Royal. We appreciate the information on insurance and have attended some of the webinars that have been offered over the last year from insurance agencies. Um, the information that was provided on how to harden your home and how the insurance company should be offering insurance is now we're asking those questions and, and to determine insurance is, is super useful. Um, I'm curious, though, how this helps for the uh, residents that are in the uh, very high risk areas. 
and our personal experiences in insurance companies, we go through all the home hardening things that they ask. And we've done a number of things far in excess of what's listed on this list. And, and when we talk to the insurance companies, they say, great, great, great. And we give them the address. And they'll call back you know, within 24 hours and say that they're not going to write you any insurance. Um, so it, it's great for the insurance companies that will write insurance, but it seems not useful for, for many people if they're just looking at errors and I'm not going to write insurance. We realize that the California Fair Plan is, is the backstop. Um, but the California Fair Plan um, costs are close to ten thousand dollars just for fire insurance, and you have to do the wraparound on top. Yeah. So, um, thank you so much for your question. I, I appreciate it because that is something that a lot of people are going through as well. Now, this is you know all of this that we are that we are doing is very much so our way of battling this fire that we're having as well. Um, and so, it's not going to be something that's going to work out. You know, in the in the immediate, we're, you know, we're, it's it's going to it's going to take time for us to to get it together and for insurance companies to catch up. It's so so on on that end, unfortunately, that's the reality of it, right? Um, what we are trying to do is very much so, you know, uh, for this that the fair plan is part of the solution as well, um, because we are trying to make sure that they also have enough. To be able to cover um, uh, local local communities who have done all this work as well, and there have so we have there's a few things uh, when the commissioner came on board the fair plan um, the fair plan had uh, they would only cover uh, homes up to 1.5 million dollars right and that was for years decades that was what it was and so. The commissioner came on board and we in 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 uh and, and changed that to three million dollars now. So at least there's that. Still in California, there are still some homes that don't, you know, don't don't qualify there. However, you know, we're we're moving in that direction so that at least we're there. We're also trying to make sure that um because the fair plan only offers fire, we are the commissioner also um asked the fair plan to provide a full uh, full coverage, um, the fair plan sued. <laughs> so unfortunately, we are, you know, we uh, a, a judge did uh, say that the commissioner had every right to request that and that that was, you know, that they, they, they needed to do this. Um, but now the fair plan is still, um, you know, battling that. So in a sense, you know, we're, we're still working on that. Um, but that those have been, those are the, the, the big, hurdles that we have to, to go through. Now, the other thing on, on this is, you know, for, not, for homeowners, this is not necessarily uh, individual homes, but right now, as of this last month, um, the Fair Plan has also agreed to increase its coverage for commercial, which means HOAs, uh, up to 20 million which was not, it wasn't the case before. And so we have most of the HOAs are now able to actually uh, get coverage that way. Um, but we will continue to try to, to, you know, to work on this. The idea that, you know, the overall idea of this is very much so that if, we, if, if the communities work together, we can actually come in with, here's the, you know, this is, the, there is, the risk is, is almost non-existent now. There is no reason why you shouldn't be doing this. Besides that, on a on an immediate for for you and for anyone who's been who's having trouble with uh, finding insurance, we do have a top ten uh, tips for looking for insurance, and so that has you know just different things to do. But one of the big things that I try to tell people uh, to do is um, you know normally most people will go to your local broker or your local the local folks that you are that you've been dealing with forever, right? Um, I would suggest to call uh, agents in other communities. So maybe someone in San Diego, someone in Los Angeles. Um, the idea behind that is that sometimes they actually have their work. They might be working with an insurance company that has their book of business doesn't have so much uh, risk here in this area. And so they might be uh, more apt to say, okay, I'm willing to take 
this one person or that. So then those are things that you could do. Um, it's, you know, just, just call outside of your area. Um, and I know that that's not very, uh, um, you know, local brokers don't like to hear that, uh, but it is, you know, it, it's, a, it's another thing that you might be able to do there. I have one quick uh, comment and follow-up. So thank you, those are also all excellent suggestions. Um, it looks like that the CAL FIRE risk map that's um, being implemented um, for our area here um, significantly increases many or almost all of our areas fire risk from one level to a higher level. Um, and so I, that's prob the comment is it'll probably make all our insurance more difficult and more expensive. The, the question is, is, when does that officially get implemented that the insurance companies may start using that? Insurance companies do not use that. Um, in the past, uh, actually, actually and, and the reason that I'm, I'm saying that, I'm not just saying that just because, um, but rather uh, it's because these maps had not been updated since 2001. And your insurance, I bet you anything that your insurance has gone up in those 20, you know, in those 20 years, right? So that means insurance companies don't use those maps to, to do that. Um, so that's the short end of it. However, it does, at the end of the day, it does, what it does do, it does, um, it does kind of go through like, okay, where are the places that need more support? And the idea behind this is uh, Cal Fire is one of the main agencies, the main agencies that has the grants that they support for, uh, for mitigation and, and, and you know, um, all, the, all the different types of things that they, that they need to do to make sure that fires are, um, are, are kept at bay. And so that's really what that is used for, to make sure that, you know, to, to look at where, do, where does this funding need to go. Insurance companies have their own, like I said, their fire risk score. They remember that uh, what was uh, proprietary information that you now will be able to see, that's their fire risk score. And those are the ones that you will be, um, that you will be, uh, they'll be using that you will be able to uh, look at as well. A couple of quick follow-ups on that. So are you saying that on the rates that they just submitted, um, your MAP score of risk is not one of those criteria that they look at for mitigation? No, they, or... not the, not the, they have their, their wildfire uh, risk score. Right. They have their own. I'm saying that the Cal Fire um, uh, maps that they're that they're doing right now that that's not what this is what this is going to be used for. And do we get to see as a customer how they have based that wildfire score for the community? Yes, that, yeah. that's okay. the that's the that's the new thing about the regu the, okay. the regulation. And then the fair plan was curious. Did they did it have to submit? To the same mitigation yes. risk, so they have submitted a plan that if you're on the fair plan, you can get discounts for your mitigation as well. Yes. yes. So it should lower your rates on the fair plan. Absolutely. Okay. Good. Next. My name is Rusty Day. I'm resident in Portola Valley, I want to, first of all, thank you very, very much for coming. It's uh, so uh, satisfying to see such informed outreach and it's a real public service and we desperately need more of it. So thank you very much. Uh, and I want to begin with a second comment, which is about the fire hazard maps. And I want to thank you also for clarifying what has been a lot of misperception and confusion about the Cal Fire maps. They are not used by the insurance companies uh, to uh, rate our qualification for or rates for fire. The, fire fire. the insurance companies have for years had their own assessments, far more advanced and far more detailed than anything Cal Fire does. Uh, Cal Fire is a prioritization of money for mitigation. And uh, it's desperately needed. And it's very important that they be as accurate and comprehensive as possible because it protects all of us. So uh, we shouldn't be resisting uh, the categorization of the hazards that we confront. We should be embracing it. I want to thank you for clarifying that. I have a couple of detailed questions about the regulations. 
and I'll just make them as quick as I can. The first one is with respect to the mitigation discount that you referred to, is that now required as a matter of law from all insurance companies underwriting fire insurance in California? Were they required to provide a mitigation discount? Yes. Okay, and, and, and is that embodied in law or in regulation? Or? It's regulation. Okay, and we can find that on your website? Yes. Okay. There is, um, you, can, you can see it. I can, I can email it also to um, whoever. Yeah, I can we can, we can, and we can yeah. And, and, and the reason I ask is because I've inquired of my insurer, State Farm, about the mitigation discount. They don't know anything about it. And and you know it's I you know I'm I'm paying through the nose for insurance I I, I pay a lot, uh, but it's odd to me that their their agents don't know anything about this and can't help me with it. So but since the new rates have not been vetted by the Department of Insurance yet, mm -hmm. is that acceptable part of that maybe they have not incorporated those yet and they're waiting until they're forced to have new rates. Is that there is so there's there's that part um, that right now we are we are reviewing all of all of them. Uh, but remember I told you that there were about 40% of those who had already been doing some of this. So if your broker or agent is not aware of any of that, call the Department of Insurance. Okay. And we are able to then contact Help inform the broker about the four, their company's the, the, the obligations. Folks, <laughs> the folks that have that information and try to figure out if there is something there for you. Thank you. Uh, if that is, you know, if, if that is the case now, or maybe you have been receiving it and they didn't know, or you know, somehow. Thank you. And and then the second detailed question goes to the fire rating, the, the fire hazard or risk rating of the insurer. Uh, so do I understand correctly, also as a matter of law, we're now entitled to see the criteria by which they score uh, your property for fire hazard. And they're, they're required to disclose that to yeah. us. And the last question is, are those criteria consistent across, the, by regulation, are those criteria consistent across all underwriters or can each company develop their own set of criteria and apply an individuated, you know, they're, their yeah. idiosyncratic set of criteria. So, so there's the thing, there's the rub. <laughs> uh, because um, the commissioner doesn't want to, there's, there's two things on that. Besides the criteria, um, the other question that we also get is, so then is it going to be the same percentage of discount that everybody will get? And it's not. Um, every insurance company has to figure that out mm -hmm. and has to kind of you know do it on their own. The idea behind that is that this is supposed to then create competition within the market. Mm -hmm. And so then whoever can get you the better rate deserves your business. My, my question is a little bit different. I, I understand that different private companies could have different cost structures and therefore provide different discounts, it, you know, it might be a 7% discount, it might be a 2% discount based on the company. But my question was about the uh, fire hazard rating. So if, if, for example, I'm rated 150, the criteria by which I'm rated, by regulation, is every company required to apply the same criteria or does every company get to choose their own set of criteria by which to do that rating? I want to make absolutely sure that I give you the correct answer to that because I, as I am aware, I believe that they all, um, they all, that's why they have their own, their own, uh, their own risk scores that they have come up with. So they all, they, they, so it is not. Um, so one possibility would be to shop companies and look at their different criteria by which they, by which they, do. they mm -hmm. rate. And you may find a more favorable, meaning a more responsible company using a different set of criteria. Is yes. That yes. So there's, so yes. That's, yes. <laughs> that, uh, ultimately, that's the, um, that's the thing. It, it was what those things that the Safe Working Wildfire Framework did was very much so just put this list together that this is what they need to be looking at, right? There are others that take it further 
and do you know have other uh, other stuff? I know that IBHS has come up with a um, with yes. another. Yeah, you know, IBHS has a has a, a very set. detailed list and and also you know how much it will cost for all of this kind of thing. And so then there's different organizations that are working on this um, on, the, on the same level, but the idea is very much so. You know, here's the we just gave you the framework and then you are you're supposed to work within that and just generally the ibhs is the insurance industries institute of business and home safety and they've been developing standards uh, in conjunction with cal fire so mm -hmm. it's, I mean, there's a website you can go to to look at ibhs if you're interested but they have a very uh, clear and, and specific set of standards mm -hmm. thank you very thank much again it's really you. Great to see this out here. Thank you. Julia, as you're um, vetting all of these great from insurance companies, are, are you changing? Is that part of the vetting that you say, okay, you've got 5% discount for these home hardening things. Somebody else is getting 20%. Yours needs to come up or are you just accepting it for mm -hmm. what it is? Yeah. And if you do, is there a place that we can see those percentages, what they present to you? Is that then public information yeah. that we can mm -hmm. access somewhere to look at each insurance company? Yes, all of this is public information. They're, they're, um, they're, uh, all of their information is in, is in our website. Uh, you can actually access it if you want to have somebody walk you through it. That's our 800 number is available there and somebody can walk you through it and can show you where, where to find it and what to look for. Um, and, and they can show you that as well. So we can comparison shop a little bit online, just which company perhaps to approach. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. Yes. You, this is. My name is Greg Franklin. <clears throat> um, I joined up and uh, thanks and all the great work that the Department of Insurance is doing in this regard. Um, I have a specific question. Um, we live in a Wuri community, wildland, urban interface community. We have special insurability, the cost and availability issues here in communities like ours throughout the state. Uh, with the outreach program that you reported that had been conducted by Commissioner Lara, have you collected any specific information about cost and availability in WUI communities? And if you haven't, would you consider sponsoring such a study specifically for WUI communities? Wui communities. Um, I know that the department does have um, all of the information on, 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 we can go down to, you know, how many people are insured, how many people are not, you know, all of that type of, uh, type of information. Um, but I can certainly, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to, um, to check in. We do have a, uh, a research arm, uh, within the, within the department that can, um, that could potentially look at that if we don't have it already. Uh, but if we do, I can, uh, you know, I can request that. Well, you, you um, talk about, you know, grant program. So, um, just anecdotally, and that's why I think this sort of justifies a broader study. So I've talked to a handful of residents, Portola Valley residents recently, mm -hmm. who live in what would be regarded as the, the less fire prone areas of Portola Valley. And they're reporting to me uh, at least four or five carriers, all state farmers, specifically mm -hmm. uh, California state, triple A, um, and uh, if I mean, and, and nationwide. Um, so those four companies have canceled uh, insurance for these homeowners and required them to go to the full fair plan to get fire insurance before they'll come back and ensure the complement to what the fire, the fair plan offers in terms of fire. And their policy differential has changed from something like two or three thousand dollars a year to somewhere. I'm just using numbers here, like eight to twelve thousand dollars a year. And I'm saying this is just anecdotal. Four companies: State Farm, which reportedly uh, 
right, 20% of insurance in California. Then our uh, uh, reports that they're in, increasing the, the uh, severity of their uh, underwriting criteria. Uh, um, so, you know, that suggests to me that we're, we've got a ticking time bomb here in the Wuhan communities. And so, but we, we can't take action unless we have specific information on which to, you know, base you know, recommendations and suggestions, which is why I'm asking specifically about data on availability and cost by insurance companies. I have called uh, a, a couple of these agencies and spoken to people at the town of Paradise about their particular problems. And, you know, as, as you indicated, the insurance companies won't disclose this because they regard this as proprietary. So that's why I'm asking about this study. Yeah. So um, thank you. Thank you for uh, thank you for your question and, and thank you for bringing that up. I, um, I will certainly share that with our uh, uh, executive team and see if they may, there may be something already available that I am not aware of. Um, the Department of Insurance has 1400 employees. Uh, who are uh, working on all types of different things for you uh, in, you know, throughout the state. And so um, there might be, you know, a group already working on this. Uh, and I might not have the information myself, but I can certainly uh, see if I can find out. Um, oh. You know, we only have... Uh, we are worried uh, that uh, maybe uh, Julia can stay a few minutes and ask her ask a few more answer a few more questions, but she does have to catch a flight back to LA, so I'm cognizant of the time. Um, would you go ahead? You've been raising your hand for a while. I'm John. I'm John Richardson. I live on Westridge, which is one of our cross streets. It's okay. Excuse me. Yeah, not, so, not so close. Not so close. It's great. Right. Right. I don't We're know any rock singer that doesn't have it that close. <laughs> Whatever it is. <laughs> I, uh, I have fantasized about having a fire, uh, what do you call it? A, risk reduction uh, community mm -hmm. where I live. The problem I have <clears throat> is that I live on a street where some homeowners have gone all the way to their property and others have ignored their property. Today, we have fallen trees in the right of way. And we have immaculately cleaned up properties. We uh, activate and uh, uh, create these fire reduction micro communities to set a model for other micro communities within Puerto Valley. Absolutely. Thank you for your question. Um, we are very, very excited to be working with the uh, fire safe councils. Uh, within uh, within the state, um, we actually uh, just last week met with uh, 42 of them, uh, who are every county in this in in uh, in, in most of the state has uh, a person that is actually um, uh, working with local communities to uh, to engage with them to create fire fire safe councils, uh, and and work with them on putting all of that together. So. Um, you can, uh, you know, you can you can give us a call and we can tell you where to, you know, where to find that. I, there's also there's information on our website on how to do that, how to how to reach them and, and get all that together. But they um, they are actually there and we partner with them very closely um, to help them get information to to consumers. So we are we're happy to partner with you on that. So thank you. MJ has a question here, but I just want to interject that our town. I don't know if any of you've gotten them, but I've already gotten one from the fire department that they are sending people out to each home in the next 30 days to uh, check your house and let you know what you need to do to mitigate fire danger. And it will be 
put in a private, they say, um, online account and give you 30 days and they will come back and re-inspect. So if you have a homeowner on your street that is not complying, they will have the fire department, I assume, saying you need to act. And I also read something from the uh, insurance industry last night that said part of the insurance company's motivation is that they are betting that most homeowners will not do the mitigation work and therefore they're going to have more policies and more money. So just FYI, this is incumbent on, on us to do the work to get the rates to um, try to change and make our community more fire safe. And very safe. Yeah, thank you Rita, for saying that. Um, and, and actually, John, is that John? So, you know, uh, um, <coughs> Patty Dees is putting together a Westridge Firewise group. Did you know that? Because that group would then be the, the, the context in which you would try to get all your neighbors organized and not have, you know, spotty tuckers. Um, okay. Uh, uh, there's going to be, there's supposed to be a Firewise table. You can go over to the town hall afterwards and, and talk to someone. So, so Julia, um, my question is, all those um, criteria for the safer from wildfires, is it a sliding scale or does the homeowner have to do all of those things? Very good question, thank you. Um, the more you do, the more you can save. It's basically what we're, um, what, what we're, we're letting people know about um, because each one of those things needs to be taken into consideration for, uh, for a discount. So if you do, you know, if you do one thing, you know, that, that could be something that you, you know, you can do. Other people have asked, what is the one thing I need to do uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, because I don't have very much money or I don't have, you know, so those are little, there are, there, you know, there's this, there's a, a lot of little things that you can do that might not be very expensive. Um, but those are, you know, that those are the things that, that, uh, that can really help you and just, you know, you can, you know, add just, little, you know, little by little and those, it, and so then that's the way that they're supposed to be looking at it. Okay, and now I'm going to cheat a little and ask a follow-on question. So, so then how does the homeowner verify to the insurer that they've done any of this? Yeah, so it, it's, it's up to you as a, as a homeowner oh, to yeah. check in with you, with, with your insurance company uh, when you have done these things. Um, and so, it, you know, it depends on the insurance company, how they want to uh, verify that. They might want to have you send pictures. There are some that just say, send a picture of this, I want to see it, and then they'll, they, they might give it to you. Other folks might actually want a, uh, someone to go out and, and inspect it. And some um, are using aerial maps, And some right? are using Which aerial maps or, or maybe drones. Um, or drones. Uh, but, you know, those are those, you know, so it, it depends on the insurance company. But it does, it is, you know, as a homeowner, it's, it's your responsibility to then go and make sure that, you know, like, no, I've done the work. I need to, I need to get my, my discount, how, you know, and letting them know and, and, and making yourself available to give the information, you know, like here's, you know, it, maybe receipts, I don't know, you know, you know, those are things that you could potentially use to say that. Um, I don't know about you, but I have tons more questions, but uh, I think as we do our homework and our mitigation, uh, we, and we see what these rates, once they're posted, are, uh, we'll have a lot more questions. Maybe we can do this again uh, if uh, Joy is nice enough to come back again. I know there's another hand up, and I've tried to cover a few of the questions people sent in, but um, again, I think we're all in this together, and as we've seen, our community, all we can do and help each other will help us be more fire safe and maybe save a few bucks along the way. So thank you. Thank your boss for uh, some of the, the regulations that he's put into place, and um, a lot of those are very needed. So safe travels back to LA, come back and see us sometime and we thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Good morning and happy Earth Day. We're so glad that you're spending part of it with us today. Some of you who were here in the morning session have already heard my greeting, but uh, the slide up there gives all sorts of credentials, but the one that's the most important is that I am a resident here as well as my husband over there and that we uh, are in this together and we are anxious to learn as much as we can and to keep the costs down on do it yourself, which is why I love this name of this particular panel. Oh, here's our another presenter. Um, I'll give you a moment to get yourself hooked up. But this is Jeff Beeman, who is a homeowner, and uh, he has retrofitted his garage, which I have a question as to why, but <laughs> it looks great. It looks great and it's fire safe. So keep that in mind because uh, it's gonna take him a while to get set up now with his slides and stuff. So we're gonna start with, we have Dee Bailey and I love it that she, I don't know if her slide's gonna come up, but she calls herself retired and recovering general contractor. <laughs> Does it take a lot of recovery? I don't know. <laughs> But she did residential remodeling for 30 years around here, and she loves permaculture and learning to repair soil and catch water and do all sorts of things. So, and um, I think you're going to hear a lot about what she has done. And I will let you just start out. And with her is Richard Crevelt. And if you don't know Richard, he is a co owner of Portola Valley Hardware Store which is my go-to DIY place um, to do all the repairs that I do. Uh, so he has helped the, I understand, and uh, hopefully will join in and uh, tell us how we can save money on buying supplies for some of our uh, mitigation for fires. We just had a, just so you know, those who weren't here, um, a speaker who is outreach director for the Department of Insurance, the state. And just so you keep in mind a couple of things as you're thinking about doing mitigation work that would behoove you to get started is that the Department of Insurance has a new regulation that started in January of this year. And all insurance companies up until last week had to submit their new rate proposals and they have to, for the first time ever in the first state in the country to do this, they have to look at mitigation for fire safety as part of your rate plan. So uh, the Department of Assurance has all of the company's information that they have submitted right now, and it will be uh, vetted over the next almost two months, and then those things will be in effect. And there's transparency for the first time. If your insurance company says, I'm not going to insure you, uh, you can say why. And they have to show you the fire information and mitigation that they have done on your house to say that they're canceling you or whatever. So there are consumer protections there. And that is very timely for us doing the work ourselves. The insurance company, I read a, one of their reports that said they did this because they thought most homeowners would not do the mitigation work. And so it just ups for them. Uh, we're the biggest insurer, fourth in the, in, the, in the world, the state of California for an insurance consumers and the state, the, the state with the most insurance coverage uh, in the United States. So as they say, the insurance companies need us. Yes, they've taken a hit the last few years with a lot of wildfires, but they, they want our business too. So it's a time that we have an insurance commissioner looking out for consumers and is trying to help with mitigation, lowering your cost. You do the work, you get the return, not only on safety and saving lives in your home or your business, but you also will get it hopefully in your insurance coverage. And then couple that with 
uh, I don't know about you guys, but I got the notice from Woodside Fire District that in the next month, they're going to each home and are now in, uh, looking at what you have for fire risk around your home, what you can do to mitigate those risks that they will put supposedly in a private email, uh, private online uh, uh, secure document where you can have a month to try to improve upon those things. So it's good news for Portola Valley Hardware, I would think, in the next month of uh, doing some mitigation. And uh, we're just thrilled that uh, starting off here that Dee and Rich are here to talk to us. Great. Rita, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, they told us they have 1,400 employees. And when you call, that supposedly if you're put on hold, it shouldn't be more than a minute or two. And that you don't get just a, somebody in India or someplace, you get a real worker there. And that they really will take seriously your complaints, your calls, your questions. So um, that's a good point. We can maybe post that at the end. We yeah. can do that at the end and you can copy down. Oh. <laughs> Do you have the number anywhere? We'll make sure we'll get you the number. I'll give you the number at the end. I want to I want to speed through so that if uh, we're really here to answer you, your questions. Um, uh, the Wildfire Preparedness Committee, we had an idea this at the beginning of the year to um, maybe have a demonstration house. So it was a, a project where I I teach carpentry um, skills to folks that want to learn. And so I had some volunteers <clears throat> um, uh, decided to help me build this little demonstration house. And the idea is for folks to see what a soffit looks like, or what's an open eave, or where does this vent go? And also, how does uh, a cement siding, how do you attach it? Um, and to really get a hands-on experience of what the material feels like, uh, and also how difficult is it for you to really work with? Um, some of the stuff is really dusty when you cut it, and so there's safety precautions, those kinds of things. Um, unfortunately, I had a little caster disaster this morning as we were loading this house into the trailer, the back caster broke, and so that's why it's not here. But you can get an idea of what it looked like. It's a basically four foot by six foot, showing the class A, uh, roof the gutters and showing how gutter guards go in that's one thing that you really can do if you're comfortable on a ladder right these are all the things about do it yourself uh do you have the skills and are you comfortable in your body working on your house um if you are uh you could pop in who can actually show you how to pop in um, a gutter guard so that that will keep the debris out of the gutters um, and here's a, an opening in that cement siding, right? So we can show you how you would use a nail to, to hammer this in, because most of the siding, people use pneumatic guns to install it, right? So these are the kinds of the things you want to think about. You want to go out and buy um, an air compressor and a pneumatic gun to, to do the siding. If, again, if you have the skills and desire, um, we wanted to give you an idea, a way to just see that for yourself. Uh, we have some great vendors over in the hall that will show you all the different types of vents. This is a really nice one because the siding just goes right up to the edge of it. So it's a nice concealed look. Um, and then this is an event. Uh, it has these nice little tabs because most of the time, 16 inch on center studs, um, you'll have 14 and a half inches to put this vent in, but it also changes, right? This could be anywhere to an eighth or a half an inch difference. So these tabs are flexible so we can actually show you how to bend that and install it in a proper way. Um, and then these are the, we, call, we used to call them bird hole vents. So a lot of your homes already have little two inch vents that are in these, your soffit blocks. Um, I've got a two inch drill bit over there. You can actually see what that looks like if you wanted to drill them yourself. 
this is a continuous vent that, that goes into a closed soffit. Um, and then that's like a gable end vent. Uh, again, we can show you how you would actually cut the opening if you needed to cut an opening. Um, and then the different types of sites. We've got some products over there to show you. Uh, you can have a something that looks like shingles, that uh, looks like T11 siding. Um, here's our caster disaster. It actually turned out being a pretty heavy, uh, heavy load. So we're going to work on this. I was talking to Jennifer and Craig, and you know maybe we'll have a phase two where at the picnic we can bring this thing back out. And if someone actually wants to do hands-on, happy to um, you know, take questions or that kind of thing. And, and hopefully next time uh, we'll have a little more here for you to see and go in depth. I haven't been in the hall yet, so I didn't even know it wasn't here. I was excited to go look. I'm sorry about the disaster. That's okay. <laughs> um, Jeff, would, are you? together enough yet that you're okay to go. Let me introduce you to Jeff. Um, Jeff, you actually live in Woodside, right? Correct. I'm up on Skyline. I'm Skyline. And Skyline, where we all are community uh, together. Um, and he retrofitted his garage to be fire resistant. Um, and your background, you're an energy engineer, I understand, founder of Mountain Microgrids, a whole house battery backup solution, which is another issue. Um, but can you, I know you can't bring your garage over here for us to see, <laughs> but I know you have some pictures, if they're up yet, uh, of your garage. And um, do you want to answer my first question, which was, why, why did you make your garage fire safe? It looks great and I, it's nice. I guess you put all your expensive belongings in the garage if a fire is approaching and let your house burn down. I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to be. Oh. Sounds good. Let's see if I can actually share the right screen here. Anybody have any questions? Just, just, yeah, from Rick and D, the Rich and D, if you want to. I'll repeat the question. Say that I, I don't. I didn't hear the question. Oh, the Wildfire Preparedness Committee. Uh, that's our, that's our town committee, actually. Uh, uh, Jennifer Hammer is the chairman. MJ MJ is on it, and they're the ones putting on this. We're the ones day who are actually hosting today. this fair today. Thank you for asking. Okay, can you all? Exactly. Can you guys all hear me clearly? That's good. So, um, <clears throat> to answer the why question, my big thing was the sports car is not moving in an emergency. Um, a bunch of my equipment and other stuff in the house probably also not moving during an emergency. Um, and what I realized during our last evacuation where a couple years ago where we had to actually, like, it wasn't a forced evacuation, but it was right close to our neighborhood. The amount of scurrying around with people carrying stuff up and down the hill to other homes or to other properties, trying to evacuate stuff caused such a mess that I was just like, uh, if you can't retrofit and upgrade your entire house to be fire resistant, then you might as well do at least with a small structure to get an idea of what it costs. And now have a place where you can put all that valuable stuff locked into basically a metal box or a cement box as it were. So you can just leave it. You've got the peace of mind that it's probably gonna survive just fine. Um, and even if the rest of the house doesn't, you've got the key stuff saved right there. And then you can leave the property with a minimum amount of stuff. That's great. Thank you for, I, that's a great idea. It's like a, a fire safe lock box, but yeah. it's your whole garage and yeah. you can put a lot in there. Yep. That's amazing. And then the secondary motivation was because I actually have EVs. And so with electric vehicles, electric motorcycles, other stuff, it's like there is a kind of known quantity of them that go up and uh, go up and fire when they're when they're charging or sometimes when they're just sitting there. And so it really depends on the chemistry of the batteries that, that are in these cars. But I was like, huh, I live in the middle of a forest. If one of these things catches on fire, I don't want it burning up the building that it's parked right next to. And if it catches on fire inside, 
I want that same fire safe box so that I can't actually catch the trees the rest of the property when I'm fire. Wow, thinking of the community as well, that's great. Yeah. And then you can take it one additional step and that is the idea that um, this now becomes part of kind of the moat of your property. And so that like you've now got buildings that are kind of away from your building that aren't going to catch on fire. Thus, you've got a, you've got a lower chance of your actual house catching on fire. And so again, this was about 50 feet from the house. And so now I know I've got a, a, a cement box that hopefully will not catch on fire. And, and again, all the rest of the shrubbery and everything else is away from the house. So there's less of a chance for the house to actually get embers on it. Wow. Nope, they don't care. Well, they didn't, that's, they did not no. lower your rates for having this. No. no. They did strangely for, and this is a AAA, it's in the state farm is where I'm with. Um, they did strangely drop my rates 30% because I had upgraded all the infrastructure and in property. So the water, the plumbing system had been redone, the electrical fully redone, and I think the roof needed to be class A and one other, I forget what it was. But if you've replumbed and re redone the electrical in your house, then you get a 30% discount. Wow. Not necessarily fire safe, but yeah. It, has that been since the first of the year when the new rate um, that is required by the Department of Insurance went into effect? I don't think so, because this uh, last premium I paid, I think it was nine months ago. And, and that is one of the things we learned every year, you should update your insurance and uh, any mitigation that you've done since then. So this year in particular, uh, you might get even a better rate. Yeah, it'll be fascinating to see what they do. It will be. So um, I think the first step to home hardening is really kind of understanding what resources are out there and really where the kind of the danger zones or quick upgrades. And there's a number of different places that have a lot of information on this. So I'm gonna go through a couple slides really quickly. Um, but basically you're looking for protecting your house against flying embers, direct flame or radiant heat. So these are the three main things you have to worry about. And again, making your exterior, uh, choosing the correct exterior materials along with a defensible space increases the chance of survival for your structures. Um, so again, defensible space zone zero, this is the zero to five perimeter. This is really what I focus on for most of my house. And so like stuff like deck boards, you can replace like just a couple, like, uh, like two to three deck boards that are right up against your house with fire resistant material. Um, and so that's a very easy, quick upgrade. Again, uh, you can add kind of a wainscot to the exterior of your buildings along uh, decks and stuff like that by adding hardy cement fiber board, which is fire resistant instead of wood paneling. And so you can still end up painting that and make it look like the rest of your house, or you can get a two-tone kind, of kind of a different look. But it's a very economical, you don't have to replace all of your siding, you don't have to replace your entire deck in order to really upgrade um, this zero to five foot perimeter around your house. And again, the second thing here, um, really using gravel, pavers, concrete, don't use wood mulch right up against your house. Uh, I found that in almost every one of the guides. Um, and the other big thing you'll notice in all the fire prevention stuff seems to be maintenance. It's making sure that all that fine um, you know, stuff from the trees, leaves, et cetera, are away from that, that zero to five foot perimeter. And so an awful lot of this stuff really is maintenance. Um, going into a number of the different components, so we've already kind of covered some of the stuff in that uh, house example with the vents, the roof, the gutters, etc. Uh, but these are different areas um, on the left hand side that you should focus on um, for choosing fire resistant materials or um, doing again incremental upgrades. Someone uh, on text is telling me there's no oh. Okay, I'll try a little closer, see if this helps. It definitely echoes now. Thank you for the feedback. Thank you for the feedback. We'll try a little bit more. Oh, now it's okay. Good. So, um, looking at the this example here, and this is again the uh, city city of Beverly Hills released this nice little diagram. You can see kind of two house examples, one on the left and one on the right. And the one on the left um, highlights a number of different uh, kind of classic features, um, which are all fire not unsafe. So wood roof shingles, having open or exposed eaves, um, having wood siding on your house, um, windows, single pane with no screens. Any one of these factors are kind of like easy to, I mean, they're low hanging fruit. They're things that are things that you can easily replace and things that would definitely increase the fire preparedness of your house. 
Again, you see the, uh, the bottom three here, mulch using bark or wood chips right against the property or right against the structure. Um, openings, um, any vents that don't have that brand guard or the uh, self-sealing vents is what she was showing with all the example different vents there where they're, if they're exposed embers, they actually close up. Um, and then finally, it says here the deck and the standard space and combustible material. So in fire resistant areas, they encourage you to put more space between the boards so that um, debris can fall through them. And again, building them out of non-combustible material. Um, on the right hand side, you can see a number of these different examples where they've upgraded them to be more fire resistant. And so choosing um, like a, a class A roof, metal roof or uh, class A shingles, having closed eaves, box them up. And again, in my case, I put uh, hardy, uh, fire rated drywall and then hardy cement fiberboard to close the eaves and the soffits. Um, choosing fire resistant material and siding. It's already been mentioned, but hardy cement fiberboard was one of the top picks that I saw. And of course, you can also use metal or other, other materials as well. Um, windows was kind of a key one. Using dual pane tempered windows. Um, tempered glass is already kind of uh, more hardened. And the dual pane, if the outside shatters, the inside tends to stay intact um, during uh, fire events. And so that again, keeps those embers from coming into your house. Um, I took an additional step. I had an extra four by eight sheet of hardy cement fiber board, and I just left it right beside the only window in the house and the, the garage now. And so if it's in an extreme situation where evacuating, I can actually just screw that right over the top of the window. And so it doesn't have any openings now that aren't metal or, or sealed. Um, mulch, I surrounded the entire garage with an eight foot perimeter of, of uh, gravel and replaced a wood retaining wall with a cement one. And so the thing now has an eight foot moat around it basically where even the fences have been replaced with instead of wood. I was writing up the detail the day I was uh, having a contractor attach the, the new wood gates to, to the um, structure. And I'm like, wait a second, why am I putting metal flashing? Why am I attaching wood to this fireproof structure? <laughs> and so I paused for a moment and I said, no, we're gonna have to revisit this. And I came back in two weeks later and actually decided to go with a metal gate and then fill it in with um, the composite wood that I was using, uh, the cement fiber board rather. Um, so it looks like a, a kind of metal trim with wood insert gate, but now it's all cement and metal. Um, coming down here to the openings, I just didn't have any. The thing is completely sealed at this point and has a dehumidifier in it to control humidity. And so the garage is actually, it, it, it's insane. It keeps its temperature plus minus two degrees, no matter what the temperature is outside at this point. So it's like super insulated as well. Um, and then going into the deck, you see down here uh, for normal, normal properties um, where you've got a wood deck up against the house, um, increasing the joist space using foil faced uh, tape uh, on the top of the rafters or the top of the carriers, I don't know what they call those, um, and using non combustible material if possible. So again, I got all this information from a lot of really good guides that are out there. Um, so Cal Fire has a readyforwildfire.org website and it, it has almost all this. And that's also where I linked off this PDF um, here on the right. And so it's a little 20 page guide that has some really, really good information. Um, there's also on, on that website, a low cost retrofit list, which is like a two page checklist, which contains an awful lot of this material as well. And then University of California um, has a ucamr.edu, um, has a fire ready website as well, and a bunch of uh, materials on it. So that, that's where most of the stuff came from. So going back to the why, um, charging EVs inside or beside it um, and wanting a place to store things if I evacuate, that was the primary motivation for this. Um, the secondary motivation is it was a complete shack and it was nearly falling down, so it needed a lot of help. Um, so starting with the interior, I put two layers of Type-X uh, drywall inter, uh, interwoven. So there's no, uh, basically it's just big cement inside. Um, and so anything that were to catch on fire inside, uh, hopefully would be contained within that box. And then on the outside, um, I put uh, what they call rock wool insulation. And I brought an example of that with me, um, but it's a spun rock, uh, like it's like a rock cotton candy. Um, and so I've hit it with all sorts of torches and uh, even a weed torch, a big propane torch, and it does nothing. You can even put your hand on the other side. It doesn't even get warm. So this stuff is, uh, bugs don't like it. Um, it doesn't rot. It's uh, pretty amazing stuff, actually, especially for exterior insulation. Um, and then I coated that with a layer of metal um, to give uh, 
kind of a drying area, um, and then hardy cement fiberboard on the outside. So it looks like normal wood, but it's cement. So the entire thing is basically cement on the inside, cement on the outside now. Um, I replaced the garage door and the car, the, the person door as well with a metal door insulated and then very tightly sealed. Um, so it's fascinating now when I open and close even the people door, the entire uh, garage door kind of shutters because it's so well sealed that it's just like, that's the only place I can do is, is lifting the garage door away from the seal in order to uh, let, allow air in and out of the building. Um, I replaced, it had three windows, all different sizes, that punched around into this, into this uh, garage. I don't know if somebody was living in it at some point or something, but fascinating. But I reduced that and the skylight, um, which again is another place of the classic skylight. That's another place where embers can just burn or melt right through and get right under the structure. So I replaced all those with a single uh, tempered window, glass window in the back, a dual pane. And then as I mentioned just earlier, I left an extra hardy cement fiber board. Um, size of the window just sitting there on the ground with screws ready to go in. And so during an emergency, I, I just have to reach for a, uh, just like a drill and I can just drill this thing right into the structure and leave it, in which case the window is even protected from any debris or embers. And then I mentioned the upgraded wood gates, switch those to metal uh, for the last 10 feet or nine feet to the structure and uh, put cement fiberboard inserts in there. So I like to kind of show examples, but this, this is what the structure started off as. And so as you can see, uh, like just plywood, um, yeah, really thin, everything didn't fit. It was kind of a mess to be honest. Um, and then wood, you see all the wood fencing right up against the structure and really old wood too, which is also old wood fencing tends to catch on fire more than like a modern, like not modern, but like a newer one that's uh, not rotten. Rotten wood catches embers and catches on fire quicker. And so this was the after photo. And so again, it looks like wood siding, but it's it's hardy cement fiberboard. Um, that wood, what looks like the front wood trim is actually all cement fiberboard as well. And then you can see that garage door is actually, it's a, it looks like metal, but it's just stamped. This is just a Home Depot, like normal garage door, um, but uh, wood look. So it has a wood grain to it, but it's a metal metal garage door insulated. And here's some of the in progress picks where uh, we're putting up the rock wall. And you can see there's uh, down in the bottom corner there's metal metal trim, and so we had to custom fabricate that to the right thickness to do the uh, the to hold the cement um, the rock wall insulation as well as the hardy cement board siding. Um, but that trim piece comes all the way out and, and covers it. And protect it from the bottom. And then you can see that window back there as well. And again, that's just a single dual pane um, tempered window. I think that's it. And how much did all of that cost, would you estimate? I think, um, again, I did an awful lot of labor myself. Um, so, I mean, I had to send out like the metal stuff to a fabricator and, and I mean, the metal gates also came from someone else, but I think all in, Probably around fifty thousand. Yes. Yeah. How much is this hardy fiber board? It's not too bad. <laughs> I think you're looking at again the same price as like plywood. Which maybe I mean I don't remember that being that much of a price difference at all to be honest. Oh really? With with okay. Yeah. And would you suggest that? That's one of my questions because we have an issue with uh, a fence that adjoins a stucco house, but. Um, and if you had to replace fencing in your whole yard, it could be very expensive. If you need privacy fencing and not just the wire fencing. So I um, had the same, same problem. I initially wanted just metal with metal uh, vertical pieces. And I was like, ooh, I might be storing like my garbage on the left side of this garage. I don't need to yeah. be showing that off to the whole neighborhood. <laughs> so um, that's where I ended up just using, I had, I had an awful lot of extra trim um, that I'd over ordered. And so I ended up having the perfect amount. I think one, I needed one extra piece to be able to finish all this with the, um, it's hardy cement fiberboard trim instead of wood. And so that's what you see inside the gates here on this picture. And wow. that, that allows you to go solid and then you can paint it whatever color you want. And would you recommend a kind of, we still have single pane windows um, and that's a huge cost. <clears throat> uh, a 
the best way to go. You talk about tempered class and uh, certain things you should look for in replacing windows. What would you suggest? Windows are complex. They definitely are. Um, you have to choose the right frame material um, and you want to make sure you get the right, uh, again, dual painting and tempered and some other factors. Um, I, I did a bunch of research, but I, I definitely don't, I feel like I'd scratch the surface there. And so, you, yeah. You want to share what kind of window you bought, what brand? It was TimberX. What's it called? TimberX, I believe. Timber I'll have to look it up. Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, there was nothing available from Home Depot that matched any really uh, fire com compliant stuff. Let's put it that way. Uh, yeah, you do have you, to go custom. Do you I, would, um, and I would just say, uh, Go to your local vendors. Uh, we have some great um, pine cone lumber in Sunnyvale and Bruce Bauer in Palo Alto. Um, and take them a couple photos of your house. Uh, they're happy to discuss different brands and cost. And like you said, the different types of frames. But um, use our local vendors. I, I wouldn't go to Home Depot. <laughs> go to your local, local vendors and they'll get you some, the information that you need. What about, should you then, what kind of frames? Not wood? I mean, you, it sounds like you're saying not wood. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was looking at a combination. I think Fibrex was one of the one of the options I was looking at, or uh, metal. And I settled on metal. And so it lets a little bit more heat through. It doesn't. Uh, it's not quite as insulated. But um, again, metal and glass on cement seems like a pretty solid thing for fire. And it looks like screens are recommended fire safety. But again, another little detail there. Make sure mm -hmm. they're metal. Um, and all of those screens nowadays are plastic. Oh, really? Yeah. And those come with the windows or? Yes. yes. Yeah. Gotcha. I'm learning. Yes. <laughs> I hope the rest of you are too. What about, um, <clears throat> let's see, you mentioned the windows and the garage door. I'm also looking for a new garage door. You recommend obviously metal. I found that, again, uh, like all the materials out there, an awful lot of them tend to be fiberglass or plastic, um, but you can easily, metal is a very, just, it's like one upgrade. It's like one step off the bottom and over almost all these manufacturers. Um, and then I also found out that insulated um, made two big differences. Um, metal without the insulation, they kind of clack and clatter as they're coming down. With the insulated door, it's dead silent. It's quite amazing. It just kind of glides down into place. So. Um, Definitely insulated for just the sound upgrade is worth it. Uh, but when you also factor in if the rest of the building is really well sealed or if you're planning to keep or cool the inside of that space, uh, the insulation on in this thing, like I said, with really tight air sealing plus the insulation, I have been blown away. Um, I really wish that all modern construction was like this. Um, it doesn't change temperature anymore. Hmm. Um, I can heat it up with either just charging an EV inside of it or a little small heater, portable heater and it'll keep its temperature for like two days. Is the metal door insulated uh, heavier that you need a heavier duty no. garage door opener no. or anything? No. It's like a spray foam insulation. It's pretty light. Oh. Well, I'm asking all my questions. I'm ready for you to ask yours. I'm sorry. Lindsay, will you go to the mic please? And we are recording this so that folks can benefit from listening later. So that's why we're asking you to ask your questions on mic. Lindsay Boyne, uh, my question is about the windows again. Have you ever heard of putting a sheet of probably tin roofing, corrugated roofing over the window where you can Paint it up against that in case of fire. You have the time to put it over there to reflect enough heat, keep baby out of, of the house. I, I haven't, but that sounds just like what I'm doing with the cement fiberboard piece. Um, so it sounds very baby. similar. It's just shielding it from the outside, from the element. Yeah. Yep. Well, I'd probably only put it up when it didn't need any light. Uh, and I was thinking, do you need insulation on the back of that? Um, Piece of metal. Again, um, I think the practical side of me says no, because if it's uh, kind of, if it, even if it's rock wood, you have to fasten it to that piece of metal and make sure that it's still secure. Yeah. But um, the window itself, especially if it's dual pane, it should survive. 
Uh, the sure. biggest thing is you just want to try to give it one extra chance or give it just a little extra buffer um, so that stuff isn't directly blowing against it. Yeah. I wasn't going to buy dual pane windows. I was going to buy <laughs> less expensive metal roof. So what I was trying to find and I couldn't find on the market was actually uh, shutters that would close automatically. And so they have storm shutters back these for hurricanes and other stuff that you can just kind of like have on the outside of the window and then fold close and latch. Mm -hmm. But what I was trying to find was something that uh, as soon as a fire got near it, it would be thermally activated and would, would then be able to close. And I couldn't find anything on the market. Um, but the cement fiberboard siding and given, given it an extra sheet from the project was free. So it worked really well. Sounds like a good product if anybody out there is listening to invent something. Or <clears throat> Questions out here? John Hans. Maybe a, a hard and involved question involves a lot of thought for me. I'm struggling in, in my house and my project with how to prioritize this um, so that I can do the low hanging fruit first, but also the important fruit first. Uh, some projects are so involved that if you started on them, eventually you would be down to the studs. So, replace the siding on my house would lead to the insulation, which would lead to the wiring, which would lead to the structural stuff. And, you know, I probably should have just torn the whole thing down and started over at that point. So I'm looking for, you know, smaller steps, um, higher priority things, things that are decoupled and not such giant projects. One of the strategies I've tried to use, and I'm kind of interested in your comments on this, um, I've looked at the three risk factors. So, you know, my house is, is at risk from blowing embers into places where it will catch on fire. And that's something that will happen when the fire is far away. We see fires like this come through neighborhoods, and it's not a wave of flames consuming homes. It's homes that are a half a mile or a mile in front of the fire that weren't very ember resistant that are suddenly catching on fire. I don't want to be that one. So I, I, I think I'm prioritizing ember resistance first. And then one of the, my, my next prioritization is, is direct flame. I don't want something like the fence to catch on fire and carry that fire right up to my house. And most of those things are pretty easy. You can move the wood pile away from the house. You interrupt the fence with either wire fence or, or if it needs to be a privacy fence, some sort of metal fence. Um, and, and those kind of projects aren't really very coupled with other things. And then, and then I get into radiant heat. And radiant heat is when the, when the big fire is now getting close. And a lot of those projects are the, the harder, the more expensive fires because you really have to, you know, not just keeping little embers out. We like, like have, you know, the blow torches now pointed at the house. The siding, the insulation, the windows, all of those kind of things begin to play. And I guess what my Part of my thinking is, is that living in the redwood trees, neighbors' houses relatively close, that at the point that I get to defending myself from radiant heat, I'm probably toast anyway. Certainly, if the if I get a crown fire in the redwood trees that surround my house, radiant heat from that, it will burn whatever. I'm not even sure Jeff's concrete box is going to survive that one. The box will, it's just everything inside will burn because it got so hot in there. What, what are the panelists' thoughts on kind of how do you prioritize where you start? Those, you know, that's, that's, that's what's happening in my mind. And, and some of them I've started on. Others of them I don't know what to do. Um, let me interject here that probably time to bring up MJ, MJ Lee, who's part of the Wildfire Preparedness Committee and who put together these seminars uh, and tasked me to moderate, um, has done her own wildfire journey. And she has been working on this for years with just what you said of what to prioritize, how long it takes, how much it costs. Um, and so if you wouldn't, unless the other panelists have something to... I have one, one direct reply to that, and that is uh, if you have a list, um, as I did, with a whole bunch of just projects that you've got coming up, 
um, finding a piece, like a space in each of those projects just to kind of prioritize a small upgrade. So you don't feel overburdened with trying to do it all at once. Um, and again, if you know that your deck is gonna get replaced, being able to do just like a retrofit of that as part of that project um, and planning these into projects as opposed to really trying to do everything from scratch. It sounds like great advice. Um, MJ, do you wanna share? Yeah. She's yeah, got great to... slides to show you what she's done. Yeah, I think this might help answer your question because we all have that question. Where do we start? You know, the insurance, uh, Julia, the insurance representative gave us a list of like 12 things, right? So where do we start? So, and I'll just give you the answer. You just pick one and, and you know, get started because the thing is, the wildfire scientists are telling us we have to do it all. So you're never going to do it all, but just pick the ones you can do and, and get started. That's the main thing. So this is my journey. Um, th this is Google Earth of my house. And uh, here's a photo of before. You can see, I don't have a pointer, but in the middle of the picture, I had a, a wood fence and gate on the left side of my house, and I had a hedge, right? So this is today, that wood gate and fence is now replaced by a metal fence and the hedge is gone. Here's a uh, better shot of the, this is a custom job. So it was, you know, kind of pricey, $8,000, but, but we, uh, I don't know, we liked it. It was sort of Japanese. <laughs> um, now, this is an older uh, picture of my home, actually going backwards. So if you go up this side of the house, you'll come to this next photo. And this is to show what kind of uh, chaos I had back there. Starting from the front of the picture, I had a manzanita hedge, then I had ivy next to the house. Then I had a deteriorated wood deck. Uh, the K is cut off in my deck. And you can see I had a lot of clutter. Um, behind that deck was actually a wood fence attached to the house that had a vine growing all over it. And this is what it looks like today. Basically, all that ivy and manzanita hedge, I removed that myself. One of the advantages of the pandemic was I had no gym. So <laughs> this, you know, the, the wood, you know, uh, uh, the fire, wildfire mitigation became my, my sport. I still have some clutter on the left, but I, I want to point out one thing. You can see what I one thing I did do is I had uh, I have several of these uh, plastic resin, you know, tool sheds, and those things are highly flammable. And the worst thing is to put flammable stuff inside of them. So if you're storing gasoline or whatever, you know, don't do that anymore. Um, but I am trying to put that shed as far away from the house as possible. And you can see actually where I had that wood fence, it now has a little, um, you know, brick wall instead. Okay. Now this is my patio before we had this, again, the deteriorated redwood deck. We had uh, the, this pistache, which when I looked at this photo, because I forgot how much debris it used to drop. And this would go in the gutters, all over the roof. And then I had a lot of vegetation. Um, and this is more vegetation on the other side. I, I kind of forgot how much stuff I had there because this is what I have now. And we're calling it our, our Zen garden. Um, now, at the time I started this, uh, you know, I used a Trex deck. Trex is, it, you can't use it right now because it's only class B, but I started this even before I joined the wildfire committee. Um, so, uh, but basically it's a huge improvement over the redwood deck we had because frankly, our gardener fell through it, our, our old deck. So that, that was actually where we got started on that job. And if you look closely at this uh, deck and you can see we have this uh, one eighth inch screen at the bottom and that helps keep out debris because when I removed my old decks, I actually collected two giant yard waste bins full of litter you know, leaf litter, rat's nests, all kinds of stuff under the deck. I had no idea, you know, plus a lot of junk that I'd thrown under the deck. So 
anyways, and we kept this maple and this camellia bush on the side because, you know, the bird habitat and another thing in, in the pandemic is my husband hung up a couple of bird feeders and now, you know, that's our big thing. So, so we have to have those trees and, and hopefully if they're well watered, you know, when the wood side, wood side fire comes around, they'll, they'll be okay with those. Now, this was another project uh, during the pandemic. I had a hundred feet of hedge all along the south side of my house. And I removed that myself. <laughs> it was 10 weeks and every week I would cut down shrub and stick it in my three compost bin. <laughs> and that, that took me through the whole summer. Okay, and then the other thing is when we replaced it. So we put in these land uh, planter boxes and, um, and that also became Lowell's new hobby. Another thing we did is we installed, uh, I, you can see on the right side here, I had this decrepit wood, wood fencing. And so we replaced 20 feet of that with just simple hog wire fence. And that, that was a lot cheaper than the other side and was more rural. So that was only a thousand dollars. Other things we've done around the property is we've really limbed up the redwood trees that we have. You know, these, we limbed them up 10 feet. And these at the corner, we limbed up seven. And um, you can see actually in, in this part. No, it doesn't like my fingers. Anyway, so that's all the work we've done. We still have a lot, or not a lot. We still have more things to do. I have this coyote brush you saw in the last photo. I need to, you know, space those out better. I haven't done vents yet because I have to mitigate a water problem in my house before I, you know, reduce the airflow to the foundation and the attic. I want to harden the doors. And I also have, I mostly have stucco, but I do have some wood siding. And my plan there is just to seal all the cracks so that embers won't, you know, get into those cracks. And I need to enclose the eaves. Now, the upsides of all the work we've done is that I found it's less yard maintenance, it's less roof debris, less water use, and you know, uh, less rodent problems because there's no you know landscape for them to run underneath. We we feel actually my husband initially started the uh, limbing up of trees and removing some other hedges years ago because he wanted better security where he could see out to the streets as it, you know, as much as people see in, but, but basically there's no place for people to hide and that kind of thing. So, and the upside is, well, right now I still have an insurance and hopefully after what they told us this morning, you know, that will continue. And, and the last upside is, you know, my husband's become a great rural farmer and these are giant pumpkins yeah. <laughs> and, and our grand doggy. Yeah. So that's it. <laughs> that looks great. <clears throat> and I hesitate to ask, but you did a lot of the work. How much do you think that you've done so far cost? Well, um, so I looked at uh, how much we'd spent over four years. It was like $25,000, but that included, you know, making the Zen garden and that expensive steel gate. So basically every time we removed seven trees and every time you remove a tree, you know, it's a couple thousand dollars. Um, that was one of the questions that was sent in was about the high cost of doing this and whether the town at some point might look at, they. this is what the homeowner that sent in the question said, um, a neighbor said we may be house rich, but cash poor. True for so many in this area. Um, this person says, last summer I spoke with the mayor of Woodside about their town and they subsidized their residents for um, cutting down trees. He said the town council voted to allocate general funds. How about doing that in Portola Valley? And I think you know something you told me about Jennifer Hammer doing. Yeah, Jennifer Hammer, our, our, the chair of our committee, is, is working on such a program, and it's going to be dependent 
um, well, she's worked out a way that we could do it even without a grant, but right now the county has applied for a grant to help fund that. So it's actually a much bigger grant than what they're doing. And so that would just be a small part of the grant the town, town has applied for. Interesting. We've seen the trees and the devastation of the eucalyptus tree, unfortunately, on Alpine, and many of us have lost trees. And I've had PG&E come and cut down two big black um, heritage oaks that one was diseased because of their prior cutting and the other was really impacting lines in our yard. And then we've cut down two on our own that were a fire hazard. So I know how expensive this can be in planning your uh, hardscaping uh, with your trees. Certainly more reasonable to get up that 10 feet clearance under your trees, which we all should be doing. Um, someone mentioned this morning about the community that you may be doing this, but your neighbor isn't. And part of this is not to tattle on your neighbor. One thing is if the fire department is coming and now checking every house uh, and writing up what they recommend for us to do for mitigation, that there is an incentive because they're gonna be rechecking a month later as well as your fire insurance being lowered by doing this. So we're all kind of helping each other. Uh, and if you have an elderly neighbor or someone who just needs a little help doing some things, that's something to do as well as to try to help them out. Um, and someone else talked about their redwood deck and stairs, which I know a lot of you, both, all of you have kind of touched on. And I, I know I have a fairly newish redwood deck that beautiful, but I worry about the five foot thing. And I explained that again. So you could just replace some boards closer to your house. Yeah. So in trying to find a, a quick and cheap way to retrofit, um, there's a number of these different guides again, them like Cal Fire and other, other institutions that have said, if you just replace the last like six or, or 12 inches of boards up right up against the house with a fire resistant material, the rest of the deck, I mean, it's not great, but it, this is a nice patch that would add a lot of fire protection for not very much money. Yeah. And really the, the main thing with that right now is to do that screening around the side so that you don't get, you know, like I had two, two yard waste bins full of debris underneath because that catches fire faster than the deck itself. Yeah. All the debris underneath or st storing flammable stuff like, oh, my propane tanks are just sitting underneath my deck or, or the play furniture or, or a pile of furniture. Um, any of those plastic things go up in flames quick. They're just like the plastic shed that you were mentioning. Um, so making sure that all that is not underneath your deck, not stored on top of the deck. Um, like I had a, one of those coconut rugs as my entryway rug, and I'm like, hmm, that'll catch some members. Yeah. <laughs> It'll go up really quickly. It's right in front of the door. So just being, I think, just being a little bit more aware of, of what you have on your deck and around your deck and around your house or our team. Yeah, that was great. Our deck is not very high, but it is open, and that's certainly something to do. Can I ask about the size of the screens that you use? I know that someone put out for the Ember stuff, it's finer mesh than what I think we have at this point. So what is it supposed to be? Mm -hmm. Do you know that? One eighth inch is what they're recommending. One eighth uh, inch. The minimum. Uh, if they, they do make a one sixteenth, uh, but the problem with that is that it does, uh, it can accumulate dust, which uh, will prevent it from Treat you know your your rent really is important to your house. Your house needs to breathe. It needs to bring air, uh, let the hot air out, and bring cool air in. And so you don't want those to be clogged. So unless it becomes a maintenance issue if it gets too small. So that's another thing to consider. You know, I actually brought along a sample of this thing called Birch Fire Mesh from Australia, and um, they use it all over the place. It's between one eight and one six. But it's not really approved here for anything. So, but I, I did bring this sample. But it, this could be if you're not selling your house right away. This might be a cheap alternative. Is it fire resistant though, or, or is it? It's probably metal. Probably it's not. It's but the metal would be. Right. So if you think about if you think of this up and up in the or something like that, it, it hopefully should not be direct uh, getting exposed to direct flames unless the entire structure is already caught. 
Yeah. But if it's catching just embers and leaves and stuff like that, that, that material should be able to um, hold up. Yeah, ember resistant, not fire resistant. Not fire resistant. Yeah. Um, and Yep, yep. If you if you put, they suggest either metal flashing, which I didn't find very physically attractive, um, or again the cement fiber board. If you just have, I mean, most uh, laborers and most construction crews can just take a skill saw to the bottom eighteen inches, um, replace that, and be able to match match the material and the color and the rest of the stuff. So they can they can do a decent job there. Um, and then again, it's not just the ninety degree corner, but it also tends to be that little ninety degree corner is where the debris collects on your deck. So the pine needles and the rest of the stuff, and again, maintenance, if you're on top of this, it's not there um, when a fire rolls through, but ideally that area is clean. Um, but again, that's what you're really protecting. And it's not just direct uh, windblown embers, but the embers combined with um, other material and debris that's on your deck. Let me mention Craig Taylor is the person who just uh, spoke. And Craig is a city council person, and I believe also on this committee, right? Um, but has uh, just recently bolted his foundation. I know that's more of an earthquake safety thing, but uh, if anybody is interested, Craig, do you want to just say a few words about the importance of that or whether you, I guess you can't do that yourself, can you? Well, you can. come up I to did. the mic. So I'll just do the quick plug for it. Um, there's a program called Bolt and Brace and you have to apply for it and it's a lottery. And the, the state will basically, um, if you win the lottery, then you can get $3,000 towards your um, Bolt and Brace. Um, if you are relatively low income, which, you know, again, getting to this house poor, you know, house rich, but, you know, um, income poor, I think at 70, 72,000 or less, you can get another 3,000. So you could potentially get $6,000 towards your um, bolt and brace. Um, you can do it yourself. Um, you, you have to submit plans. Um, so it's not for the faint hearted, but it's possible to do it yourself. But you can also, they have a list of contractors that you can use. Um, and I would recommend if you do it, first of all, apply to the program because it's going to take a while. They only I think it's open for like 30 days a year. And then they do their lottery and then they let you know. And I was on it for, I think, a couple of years before I got mine done. Um, the other thing I'd say is have a couple of contractors come out because I mean, one contractor I had, it was 7,000. The other contractor, it was like 12,000 for kind of the same, you know, basically the same thing. So it's definitely worth um, spending some time and energy to get a couple of bids. But it's, you know, if, if you can get in and get in the lottery, it's definitely, I mean, well worthwhile. So I don't know if anybody else has any questions about that, but I just wanted to at least, you know, mention, um, and, and it's bold and brace if you just go on the web. It's a state website and there's a place you can sign up for emails. And if you sign up for the email, then they'll send you something saying, you know, the window is open and then that's your chance to go and sign up. And then, like I said, you wait for the lottery. Um, but I, I was pretty pleased. I mean, like I said, I think I was on there for two years. Um, and then from there, the process was you get a contractor, you don't do the work until after you get approved. They're, they're very strict about you cannot start work until you're approved. But the contractor comes out and then you go to this dashboard, you fill out your information, you get the contractor involved, they fill out their information, and then they send the plans off to FEMA. And actually, I mean, surprisingly enough, getting somebody to come out and look, these guys are pretty good at coming out pretty quickly. Um, I mean, my guys came out like a week, I, you know, like within two or three weeks, I had two separate bids. Um, so that part was easy. Once you're in the program and they send something in, FEMA then takes like two and a half months to approve it. So it's crazy. You know, you're like, oh, this is never going to get done. But then they finally get approved. And then the contractor comes back and does this stuff. And then you think, I'm never going to get paid because you got to pay. The, the, the contractors like to get paid. They don't want to take a check. They, some of them will, but generally they want to get paid. And surprisingly enough, like two weeks after we're done, I got a check from the state. So, so that once you get in and you get rolling, 
FEMA is actually the longest piece of it. And that's really just waiting for their approval. It's not complicated, it's just slow. So that's kind of the process. I just, you know, if people are interested, that was worth mentioning. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, any questions? Um, if you look up Bolton Brace. Earthquake for Bolton Brace. Yeah, yeah. But if, if you just go and put Bolton Brace into your browser, you'll see it'll come up. And there's a, there's a page there, and the state explains how the program works. Very interesting program and also a good note. Anybody who has an older home, like mine was 1940s, um, with a crawl space, you likely should look into this um, because like my house is not attached to the foundation in the real way. Um, and also number two, uh, the what they call a cripple wall or a pony wall, a little yeah. short kind of cripple. three foot yeah. wall underneath your house was completely unbraced in my case. It had no lateral bracing at all. Mm, yeah. And so what they end up doing is they go in and they put, you know, plywood in there and then they've got these specialized metal braces that they can use to take the studs down onto the walls. So, so anyway, yeah, de definitely if you're interested, I would definitely recommend it. Thanks. Sure. We can see our houses are money pits and uh, doing mitigation is not going to be free, but and I have read that they don't think the discounts you'll get on insurance will probably cover the cost of the mitigation that you're doing. But if you look at it as a point of saving one, your home and everything that you own and your life and your neighbors, then it makes it cost effective. So I think that's the main thing to remember. Um, we are over, we started late. I just want to see if there are any burning questions out there or anything the panelists would like to add before we stop. Anybody? Going, going, going once, going twice, sold. Okay, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you to our panelists and our neighbors for sharing what they have done. Thank you and come back at what time? That's to make sure you're awake. Uh, good, I guess we're in the afternoon now. We've been here since 10 this morning with wonderful, wonderful seminars and speakers. And this is the last of our three panels. And just look around. We've got everybody here that uh, has knowledge that will be able to help us. And there are some, would you like to take a seat in the back? We're well covered today. If there's a fire, police, emergency, anything, we've got the Sheriff's Department, everybody's here. Um, you see the slide, I, that's me. That was a couple of years ago, not, not too many, but um, I am a retired reporter. But the thing it does not say is the thing that is probably the most important today. And that is that I'm also a resident. So I am in this with all of you and we're all learning together. And I think what we've learned today from all the panels is that it's our community and what we each do to mitigate the chances of fires at our own homes will help everyone else and maybe lower your insurance rate, but also perhaps save lives and your homes. So I think, um, this panel is a little bit more about not if there's a fire, but when and what we can expect there. And in my 40 something years of covering lots of wildfires around the state, uh, having to man hoses at times when fires turned around and caught us and that was the only way we could survive with the firefighters we were with. Um, and then aftermath from everything from the Oakland Hills fire to all of the other wildfires, unfortunately, our state has had. And my son is actually an, uh, a lawyer, and he represents fire victims, mostly in their suits with PG&E. But I've seen up close and personal victims and how we want to prevent as much as we can, but what to do if and when prevention doesn't help and nature takes over and uh, we are threatened with a wildfire. So we have a very distinguished panel up here and it looks like even more distinguished in the audience. We've got lots of, uh, lots of wisdom in this room. Um, but let me, I think I'll introduce all, let's see, one, two, three, four, five now people up here, if I can do this right. 
um, that will, they've kind of broken up their presentation among themselves. So one will be picking up from another's, but let me start. Well, he's first here, will not be the first speaker, but Don Bullard is a wonderful old time fire, Woodside Fire Department firefighter who went up the ranks and is now fire marshal of the Woodside Fire Protection District. So we're happy to have him here. And next to him is Selena Brown, and she's the Public Education Officer Emergency Preparedness Coordinator for the same Woodside Fire Department District. And you will see a lot of community communication from Selena that keeps us um, knowledgeable about what's going on. And then next to her is Brian Kelly. And Brian is also a retired fire chief and consultant with the San Mateo County Department of Emergency Management. And as you know, we're, it's an umbrella and uh, they are in charge with the county on the emergency management and then our local fire with that. And uh, let me see if I get this right. Let's see, no, this is Tony. Tony Blackman is battalion chief with San Mateo Consolidated, which is more or less, I, I know you have a lot of cities that you now are the fire department for, and you also though are our backup in a lot of ways, right? Does that make sense? Okay. And then uh, we have uh, Ryan, Sergeant Ryan Hansel at the end, who is with the San Mateo County Sheriff's Department, who will be a big player if indeed we have a fire and evacuations and other things. So we're well, very well represented. And I think the way they've worked this out is Brian Kelly uh, from San Mateo County uh, is going to start. Is that correct, Brian? That's correct. Okay, and then they're gonna take it away and I'm gonna sit back and listen and learn as a resident like the rest of us. Thank you, Brian. Very brief, uh, oh, I have to ask all of you. We learned this because people have been writing in. We also have that you have to put your mic right next to your lips. <laughs> to sort of hug the mic okay. and uh, they can't hear otherwise. So right up next to your mouth, as close as you can get it to your mouth, because we are recording this. Okay. Okay. Right. That, Thanks. That better? Better, but not there yet, Brian. Better yet, okay. Pull it closer to you. Pull it closer. You just Very really want it like within an inch of your mouth. Very uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm a little freaked out by this. <laughs> okay, how's that? That's it. Very good. You got it. Okay, when I have my glasses on, I'm off about 30 degrees on everything I do. So it's um, a little, little something I have to get used to. Let me get something close to me. Otherwise, they trip and fall, and my wife has to dock everything <laughs> over. We've got paramedics here. Don't yeah. worry. I think, I think we're covered. Uh, briefly, I was described the, the, the Department of Emergency Management in San Mateo County. Um, the Department of Emergency Management represents um, San Mateo County itself, but also all 20 cities in the county, of which Portola Valley is a member. Um, this is a joint powers authority that was started about 35 years ago. All 20 cities pay to jointly pay 20% of the cost of the emergency uh, part of emergency management. The county pays the other 50%. Yeah, uh, one of the board of supervisor members sits as the um, president of the emergency services council. It's it was a unique situation when, uh, um, when it was formed 35 years ago. Uh, many counties have replicated that as a way to include um, the, um, all. The entire county, uh, including incorporated and unincorporated areas, uh, in emergency management. So that's the, the DM fits. Uh, the town of Portola Valley um, staff could not be here today, and they asked me if I would just give a brief update on the, the, the town of Portola Valley's efforts in emergency preparedness. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of them, uh, of Brandy um, Gormo, and uh, I, I brutalized that last name. Sorry. Um, and um, so, Howard Young, correct? Howard, no. Corey. Carrie. 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 Corey. Corey. 
Yes. Oh, oh, wrong paper. Yes, Corey Stockton. Um, they wanted me to, to, to relate that the county, the city has a an active um, and formalized emergency manager plan. It was adopted by the, the town council in nineteen in two thousand seventeen. Um, they have a city. The town has a um, uh, emergency services um, subcommittee, and uh, the folks who are on the committee um, are are uh, constantly working on the um, that plan and make it up to keep it updated. And it, you know, as, as uh, uh, Dwight, e., Dwight e. Eisenhower said during World War II, plans are nothing. Planning is everything. So the constant updating on plans, and planning process is very important, and the town actively involved in that. Um, they also um, are going virtual in, in, uh, in terms of for their emergency operations center. Uh, so they um, wanted to establish the capacity. At, I'm thinking back to Katrina when people were working from home, if you have to have an emergency and you aren't gathering. Um, so they've adopted a, a, a purchase a, a, a web, web EOC, web emergency operating center that it works um, virtually, um, they can and, and will you know, operate as a standard emergency operating center in person when they, when they have to, when they can. And if they can't, they have the full capability of conducting their emergency operations virtually. So they're also backing up all of their um, critical city infrastructure uh, in, in the, the cloud, in the cloud um, format. So they will have hard copies of everything that, that the, the important documents for the city. And they also have it uh, virtually so they can be um, utilized from wherever they have to do their, their, their um, emergency um, management system um, work, for, work during the emergency. So that's about it. They all want to make sure that, uh, that they, you want to all understand their, they apologize for not being able to be here, but they're short staffed and uh, um, they want to let you know uh, what the town has uh, has done over the years and continues to do to be prepared to respond to emergencies. That I'll turn it, that I'll turn it over to Don. Okay, thanks, Brian. <clears throat> okay. So what what I'm going to talk about today is the the incident command system, which is the system that we use to as emergency responders as a group, all of us, Sheriff's Office, DEM, Fire Department, CAL FIRE. It's the system that we use to manage our emergencies. And to start that off, we'll first talk about what is an incident. An incident is an occurrence either caused by human or natural phenomena that requires response actions to prevent or minimize loss of life or damage to property and or the environment. Our overall priorities uh, are life-saving, incident stabilization, and property preservation. Those are established based on the following priorities. The incident, uh, am I putting that on the screen? Uh, the incident commander and the command staff functions are as follows. The incident, command performs, the incident commander performs all major ICS command and staff responsibilities unless the ICS functions are delegated and assigned. Positions are not pre-designed, but the roles are established and assigned as necessary, depending on the size and the complexity of the incident. There's always gonna be an incident commander. You don't necessarily always have a command staff, or you're going to not going to necessarily have a general staff, but depending on the size and the complexity of the incident, those positions can be filled. So with the incident command system, it grows and contracts as the incident grows and contracts. As it grows, we, we can grow the system. And as things start to de-escalate, we can retract from that system and, and start to bring it back down. The incident commander role, the incident commander provides overall leadership for incident response, delegates authority to the others, takes general direction from agency administration officials. It's the only position that is always filled and is responsible for all activities and functions until 
delegated and assigned to staff, assesses and the needs for staff and additional resources and establishes incident objectives. And it directs, uh, the incident commander directs staff to develop the incident action plan. So the IC is established by the first arriving unit on scene and the IC role may be transferred to the highest ranking officer at the incident, depending on the size and the complexity of the incident. Many incidents are small enough that the first arriving officer will maintain the IC role throughout the entire incident. And in the incident of a wildfire, the IC would end up being the first engine company officer on scene, and he would remain in that role until a higher ranking officer arrives. And then that, at that point, we will transfer the command. Depending on the size and complexity of the incident, a command staff may or may not be required. It may be necessary for the incident commander to designate a command staff to provide information, liaison, and safety services for the entire organization and report directly to the incident commander. Unified command may be established when there are multiple stakeholders who have a shared interest and responsibility in stabilizing the incident. For example, on the Edgewood fire, we had, uh, we had Cal Fire, we had the Sheriff's Office, we had the Fire Department, not only Woodside Fire, but we also had Redwood City Fire. We had the Office of Emergency Services or the DEM who were on scene at that, at that incident. So we set up a unified command there because of the shared interests and the responsibilities of the different agencies that were involved in that incident. Okay. In all significant emergencies, whether it's a wildfire, structure fire, um, an auto accident, train accident, um, you name it, uh, when somebody reports the emergency, it goes to the dispatch center. The dispatch center responsible for that area will dispatch the appropriate emergency resources. And those first responding um, will. will that we'll get it simplified to the first engine company captain. So the engine company is uh, your standard standard fire. We call it, you know, you, you'll identify as a fire truck. We call it an engine. Um, the, the they're typically staffed with a fire captain, an engineer, and a firefighter paramedic. Uh, in this county, they'll respond to the incident. The sheriff's department will respond to an incident that happened in Portola Valley Woodside, and that sergeant, Sergeant Hansen. And so, yeah, yeah. And, and the captain from the, from the fire department are going to be together. They're going to arrive on scene, identify what actually, you know, what the actual emergency is. Uh, and they'll, they'll jointly plan the necessary um, operations plan to deal with that emergency. Um, those two are, those two are the incident, com incident commander and, and the law enforcement commander. So if, if it's a, uh, an incident that the, the sheriff's department is responsible for, they're going to be the incident commander. If it's, if it's something that the fire department is responsible for, the fire captain will be, and they'll work together to determine what resources they need to, to order, where they're going to get it from, how long is it going to take it to get there, them to get there. Uh, so if it's a, if it's a um, uh, uh, Sergeant Hunter talk about how long it takes to get help from other agencies to any place in, in the county, in the fire department, the, the captain would request additional resources, either a special resource, I need a truck, I need a water rescue team, I need a, a, a urban search and rescue uh, team, or I need a second a second alarm, a full, full, full first alarm, second alarm, third alarm, fourth alarm, fifth alarm, sixth alarm. Doesn't happen very often, but it happened here on an Albion fire in 2001. Yeah. The six alarm fire in the middle of the afternoon in Portola Valley, Woodside. 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 Um, chief Huge at the time, you know, thought I, was for, I was the fire chief in San Mateo at the time. As he explained to me later that evening, he goes, he goes we didn't have our, our mutual aid system, on our automatic aid system, and our single dispatch resource. We had worked years to plan all these activities in case we were to have a large incident like this. In that moment of chaos, there was a plan that could be activated and the captain knew what to do. 
and a battalion chief who came to help him knew what to do. Dispatcher knew what to do. They called the resources. Cal Fire would, it was notified. They responded with aircraft and, and the full wireline response. Um, so th that was a, you know, typically um, you see a fire engine with red lights and siren going down the road to a medical emergency or a structure fire. There might only be two or three of them involved at all. Um, but on a day like that, um, I don't know how many homes were, were lost that day. Uh, well, we had multiple homes that were ignited that were on the other side of Kenyatta Road right. from the embers, hitting like wood shake roofs. Mm -hmm. So not only was did we have to deal with the the major incident itself, the, the main fire, but we had all these spot fires or other ignitions. Right. Right. So that, that, that's an example of that. You have to plan for that. So Kenyatta Road is a nice fire break normally, but when you have extreme fire behavior and wind, you have to plan for, you know, I used to call it the em before we had it formalized, I called it the Ember Patrol. I have a couple of engines go downwind and just go go find fire because those, those embers are starting little spot fires all over the place. If you can get them when there's spot fires, great. But that's part of, that's that takes resources and it takes planning and there is that chaos and and you know, um, the, the sergeant's going to be asked what we do evacuate that. What do we need to evacuate? What do we? How do we determine where to evacuate? Well, well there's now a formalized system to do that. I'll let the battalion chief Tony Blackham talk about the system. We and have. another part of that too, before you switch it over to Tony, is is the ability for that incident commander not only to be able to forecast what's going to be happening in the next hour or two hours and the resources that he's going to need, but if the if the event's big enough. You have to start thinking and forecasting. What am I going to need 12 hours from now? Uh, you know, you got to be able to look down the road. If you see that this event is growing that fast and getting that big, you got to start forecasting and looking down the road because it takes time to get those resources that you need to get them on the incident. Hey, good afternoon. So I'll share the piece with the uh, Zone Haven tool that we use now to help with this chaos period. So in the past. If it was a fire in an area not long ago we had an area we needed to evacuate i would sit there if i was the incident commander say i was the first in chief i would pull out paper maps in the back of my tailgate and i would have a sergeant like this sitting next to me and i would try to as i'm trying to coordinate all these activities we're just talking about and uh, like don was saying the incident commander is responsible for everything unless they could delegate that out so early on in the scene don't have a lot of help you got to do, take care of all those things yourself so what we do is lay out these paper maps and I'll say, hey, we need to evacuate these areas. And I would say, hey, maybe everything from north of this road, south of this road, east of, get it all studied out and translate that over, maybe draw it out and then give these marching orders to the sergeant. They would take, he would take that information to his crews and start evacuating those areas. I would then radio that to our dispatch center. Our dispatch center would then take that information, translate it over. So as you can imagine, if there's smoke in areas there, a lot of people are going to call 911 and ask, do I need to leave? Do I not need to leave? And then dispatchers will have to try to figure out as they're fielding you know, hundreds of extra calls during this time, trying to figure out that individual resident, where are they on the map? Are they part of that zone or not? So now fast forward to now, now everything's digitized. We have uh, all these different apps that are out there. Zone Haven is the one that we use in this county. It's used primarily, it's probably one of the most prolific ones you'll see around the state, if not nationwide. And the way this one works, is I could simply pull out a tablet, a phone, computer, anything that has web access, sit down next to the sergeant next to me and just literally just push some buttons and say, select different sections on the map and say, I want these zones to evacuate and maybe these zones here, just put them in advisory status. And what that does, it does a couple of things. And once you make that change, it's out there for everybody to see. So now what we have is the dispatchers can see exactly what we're doing out in the field the deputies that have come in, so not just the first in ones, but others are coming in can get the same information. Uh, PIOs would be a huge piece of us, the, the folks that get that information out, the public information officers will send out these messages through all these different mediums, will have that same spot to go to. And for the public, the public could log on and take a look at that as well. So it's just a very single source, very easy visual for to see which zones we're asking for people to leave. And what it also does is it, makes it really easy as you select the zones, it gives you a pretty good indication what you can expect for the population counts, you know, day versus night. It gives you a sense of how many vehicles you can expect coming out of the road. Because that's a, that's a huge lift for the law enforcement side. They're gonna have to start evacuating zones. So 
the easy thing to do is take a look and say, hey, let's just evacuate everybody at once. But if we try to do that, we just know it's just gonna be a huge gridlock. So we can kind of take that a little more strategic approach to that. And for example, in Portola Valley, you have about a dozen different zones that are laid out. You can modify them on the fly if need be, but they're, they're a pretty good setup uh, based on the threats of the area. And you could just, hey, we'll take these two zones here or these three zones, put them in the status. Mm -hmm. And as the PIO comes around, you can send these take that information, put that out, push it out through things like SMC alert, for example, it could be sent out by all these other applications that you, you know, next door, you name it, the PIOs handle all that and they can just send a simple link. So even if the resident never even heard of Zone Haven before, they get the text message, they see it, follow the link and you can clearly see where you're at at the moment and where the threat is. Uh, it does a lot of other things too, that particular program, kind of like Chief Kelly was talking about is, you know, where's the fire going? What's gonna happen next? That program can, same program will also do some simulations and give you based on the current event of, you know, what's the weather doing? Where you can expect the fire to go if it goes unchecked and what that might look like. But uh, again, it's just a visual representation of what's happening. Everybody's getting the same source of information, which is critical. That helps reduce all that chaos. And uh, we used it in this county several times. The first time was the CZU fires a couple of years ago. That was uh, still in a beta test at the time. We used it, worked great. Sign Hill Fire, used it for that. Used it uh, on a couple other incidences. Uh, most recently was the Edgewood Fire that we got there. So we used it on that one. In that case there, people were still responding. It was within moments of that call coming in, selected the zones, identified it, uh, put the zone different statuses. Some were evacuation status, some were an advisory status. And it made it really easy. I was on that particular call uh, as law enforcement folks were showing up on scene. Most of them have access to the zone haven. For some of them, maybe that come from other jurisdictions and don't. Pretty easy. You just, there's a little QR code. They could just click, fire it, and it'll show them all the information. So when I say all the information, the information that the public sees is a certain amount of information. But on the backside, it gives even more information in terms of population and special areas such as like the sequoias or schools and things that take a little bit more effort to, to evacuate. Yeah. Sorry, these guys pretty much talked about everything, but real quick, I have some SMC alert cards I'll leave up here. They're in English and Spanish. You guys can take these, hand them out to friends, family members. Um, they're not only used for just big disasters as well. If you guys are already signed up, you'll see it for mountain lion, mountain lion sightings, traffic accidents, all those kind of good things. So it's another electronic outreach system that we at the Sheriff's Office use is managed by us. Um, just a couple of things when it comes to evacuations, what the Sheriff's Office is gonna be help doing on these things is going door to door, using our PA, our loudspeaker to try to evacuate people, right? We'll go door to door, we'll get names, phone numbers, whether people did evacuate or not, um, cars, license plates, all those things for when it comes down to repopulation and all those kind of things. So. Um, that's kind of our role when it comes to these big wildfires and disasters. So but that's it. You guys pretty much touched. Right. And also security, right? Sometimes you see the looting and stuff, unfortunately, that happens. So we will be there for security as well. So, so I think you guys pretty much touched on the rest. Uh, so, oh, yeah, go ahead. Just to update on the, uh, to tie into also the SMC alert side. So the SMC alert, is the name of the program. We have different vendors that have used in the past, different companies, and that recently switched over from a company called Everbridge. This year, switched over to a new company called Rave. And as we switched over, there's a little bit of growing pains, a little couple things that have changed along the way. And uh, one of those is, I don't know if anybody here signed up for SMC Alert, maybe got a couple messages that say, uh, El Camino might be closed in Burlingame, for example. And uh, that right there is not an SMC Alert system problem, that was an end user problem. So somebody that sent the messages out, instead of they created a template of what that might look like, send it, this message out to these folks. What we'd like to have them do is set up a geofence so people who are in a certain area would get it. Unfortunately, the template went out in that example of the Burlingame one and the message went out countywide. So folks that live in Pescadero, Daly City, everywhere in between, we're getting these messages about Burlingame. If you lived in Burlingame, that's kind of nice to know your main thoroughfare is closed. If you don't, you're probably wondering, why do I even have this? So uh, that was identified. It, it was fixed and, uh, you know, just additional training to go through that. But there, those small growing pains are getting through there. But the way SMC alert basically works is everybody opts in 
if you want to have information you know about your different zones. There's a second piece of it, is it's a bridgeway to what they call a wireless emergency alert, the WE alert. And what that one is, it's almost like if everyone's ever heard of Amber Alerts, you know, when there's, you know, a missing child, for example, and if, if, one, if there was one in this area now, everybody's phone would probably go off at the same time, everybody would start looking at the phone. We have access to do that with a, with a WE alert. And that's a critical life-threatening situation. And, and that's not, that message doesn't just go to folks who opt in, it's anybody who's in that area. So it's just based on where you're at with your phone at the time and how long you want that message to go. So you might be, uh, for example, if there was an event here and you were somewhere else, let's say you were in uh, Palo Alto at the time, you would not get the alert. But then as you came into the area, if that alert was out there, as you got close enough to it and you hit the cell phone tower, then your phone would let you know that you're going into an area that has this problem. So it's a, it's a key point to know that is, you know, very big situation, uh, life-threatening. The message will be sent out to that same platform where, where everybody get it, whether you opt in or opt out. But well, on a smaller scale, the opt-in really keeps you posted of what's happening, what's going on. You know, I always push that somebody alert, right? <laughs> yeah, they mentioned a lot of great things, which I kind of go over too, but um, we'll have them talking in between. Uh, I just want to say that I see a lot of very familiar faces here, um, and that's fine. That's great. I always love that. Um, for those of you who have never really thought about preparing for a wildfire or who were worried, you know, but didn't know where to start, um, coming here today will make you better prepared in general. So you're already ahead just by showing up to this fair. Hopefully you were able to hit all of the exhibits inside as well as the boots outside because there's just a plethora of information for you. Um, and today we're going to be giving you more information, but just know that we have lots of uh, website links. Our WPV Ready program um, has a lot of great information as well as our Woodside Fire website, which we are working to redo. So it's going to be super great soon. Um, I just wanted to talk to you guys about personal responsibility um, in, this, in, in, in this situation of emergencies, disasters, wildfires. You know, we try to do the fire district, the Department of Emergency Management, the Sheriff's Office, we all are here to respond, but you guys have a personal responsibility to do pre-planning, to prepare in advance. This will also give you peace of mind. You know, I talk about it with earthquakes, now with severe winter weather, you, you know, there's a lot of preparedness you need to do beforehand in order to be proactive rather than reactive. You know how much stress all these things cause when they're not even happening, you can imagine what it's gonna be like when something actually happens. You're just, you're not gonna be able to focus on anything. You're gonna be completely overwhelmed. So we talk about things that you could do in advance, obviously creating defensible space, home hardening, making sure you have a plan, a communication plan uh, that you share with your entire family, um, as well as uh, knowing your evacuation routes. You need to know every way you can get in and out of your neighborhood. You need to know them yourself. Um, you, uh, you, as residents, you guys know this area probably better than we do at times. And uh, we utilize that too. It's very important for us because if there is a fire, um, if you guys may be able to spot exactly where it is, where we may need to drive around and figure out where the smoke's coming from. So we utilize your guys' skills as well. But you need to take action beforehand. Make sure you have that go bag ready with like the list of items that you need to take. You don't need to pack everything in it in advance, but you need to know what you can grab in five minutes and 10 minutes, um, however long, however short a period of time it is. It'll give you peace of mind. Also staying informed, we were talking about SMC Alert and Zone Haven. I always push SMC Alert. Be aware that recently we had a huge transition from one hosting platform to another. So there are kinks we're working out and uh, it's been brought to our attention, some of the things that uh, have happened, but um, we are still utilizing that as our number one emergency notification system. Be aware though, that we may not push out information. So on red flag days, on um, uh, high wind, uh, wind advisory days, those are the days that you need to be on alert. You need to be looking out, you need to be prepared if you need to evacuate. If you don't feel safe in your community, just go for the day. 
go to the coast, enjoy the weather out on the coast, or uh, you know, just drive somewhere else, go visit some friends, get out of the area. I know several years ago when we had our first wildfire chat talks and we were like, we will let you know, we will tell you, we don't say that anymore. We realize that that may not happen. We may not have the information or not be able to push out the information quick enough. So we do have SMC alert, we do have zone haven, but we do not want you to solely depend on those. We want you to rely on your neighbors for information, passing of information. We also want you to have some personal responsibility with that. Um, you need to make sure when you're including your plan that you are prepared with all of your animals and anybody else in your household. It's important to know your neighbors because those people are gonna be the ones that may help you if you're out of town and you have some important stuff and a go bag to grab, that neighbor is gonna be your evacuation buddy. They're gonna go over to your house and grab that bag or maybe get your animals for you and vice versa. So depending on your neighbors is extreme. It's, it's so important to know your neighbors. And that's why we have our community programs such as WPV Ready and we have our response community program, WPV Cert. Also, too, one thing um, that you can do is always park your car, back it in, right? Always have at least a half tank of gas. Because in the event of a wildfire, if there's smoke or if it's dark, you're going to be panicking anyway. You want to make it as easy as possible for you to get out of there. Just load that car up and just drive straight out so you're not worried at all. So this is uh, emergency notification terminology. This is important for you to know. You'll see this uh, on, if you go on Zone Haven, um, it'll, uh, if, if a, there is a notification for a certain zone, it'll be a certain color. If you click on it, it'll give you a legend and it describes exactly what that color means. Um, there's, we have advisories. So we have like wind advisories or we had a flood advisory. Um, so that's just that at that point, if there's any type of advisory, that's when you should perk up and be like, okay, I need to be aware. I'm not using, you know, uh, electric, uh, uh, my weed whacker or a lawnmower, you know, outside when the weather, you know, could potentially, it could potentially cause a fire. Then we have a warning. And this, at this point, if there was a warning issue to, to evacuate, I would immediately evacuate. I'm not going to wait for the order because at that point, you do not have the time to think even about what you need to grab. When it's a warning, you want to take advantage of that time and get out. Because you can leave town as many times as you want and come back. But when there's a big fire and they're ordering you to get out, you may not have that opportunity to, get, to come back in and get any stuff you need. So it's, it's essential. Also, too, you know, it, when you don't listen to these um, notifications that we sent out, it causes a lot of problems for us as first responders. Because we're gonna go through and be uh, have due diligence, right? So make sure everybody's evacuated. But you know, there's always gonna be that one person that's just determined to stay there. And that can pull a lot of resources that we need to fight fire with, to pr maybe protect um, homes that can be saved or uh, go and secure an area that has a large livestock. Also too, there's an order. So that's, you, you have to go, right? You gotta get out. We may or may not give you specific directions. We may say an evacuation order is issued for zone da da da, but we may not tell you which direction to evacuate. That's why it's important for you to know. Now, if we do tell you which way to go, please listen. <laughs> And don't try to go out another way. There are reasons why we issue, why we say certain things. The last one is shelter in place on here. And in the instance, which could definitely happen of where there's no time to evacuate or it's not safe to evacuate, you will have to shelter in place. And you may be sheltering in place at Robert's Market because you happen to be um, shopping there and there's an order immediately for sheltering in place. What's really, uh, and then at that point, fire and law, we will use our resources to protect that area, to preserve uh, life at that spot. 
shelter in a place may occur too at places such as the Sequoias or a school where it's just not feasible and smart to evacuate, they'll just end up issuing a shelter in place order and they want you to just hunker down at that point. Let me add real quick. Everyone needs to be prepared to shelter in place. That's a big deal. That's when we get back to the home hardening um, aspect. Um, uh, doing fuel, fuel reduction on your property. Mm -hmm. So if, they, if a fire does approach your community or your neighborhood, um, your house is already, you've already taken action, but your house can be a safe place to, to, to stay. You don't want to make that, you don't want to make that guess when the fire is coming. So it's really important to take action now ahead of time in preparation for that. And, you know, you're just, you're just giving your home a bigger chance of surviving a wildfire. We all know now about ember storms and how embers can, you know, take down homes. You know, we've seen the pictures of where houses are completely gone, but the trees are still there. And it seems to not really make sense, right? My brother specifically was like, it's a conspiracy. <laughs> I was like, no, it's called embers. <laughs> but he didn't want to listen. But, you know, the way our houses are built with the amount of synthetic materials inside, um, houses are going, are burning faster and faster. You know, where we used to have seven, 10 minutes before a house would be fully engulfed, it is a few minutes before it's so out of control. And then you can imagine the smoke that it's putting off with all those chemicals in it, that creates a whole different scenario. So on here, we have what's called temporary evacuation points or TEPs. And uh, we recently, the town of Woodside opened one up during the severe storms. And it was a, a place where residents could go to get information of where they could safely, if they needed to find a place where they could stay or some other resources. So they, they're called evacu uh, temporary evacuation points or assembly points. Um, I think you could probably talk a little bit more about them. The, um, the old term used to be open, that, that we would open up the shelters and tell people we're opening a shelter up at the library or the community center. Um, but th th that connotes uh, that you have a safe location that you can provide for people for an extended period of time. Well, that's not true. So we, everyone realized you know, at Red Cross, we, we already coordinate with the Red Cross, and we still do when we set up these temporary evacuation points. But um, we realized that it's not practical to, to give people the, the impression that they're going to be able to shelter there. So what happens now is you, get, you, know, you arrive at the scene, you or the temporary evacuation or assembly point. There are people there who can help you determine what's best for you. You may say, well, I, I have a, a, a you know, I, I can, do I need to, can I go back home? We don't know. You need to find some place to, to go. So well, maybe I can go to a friend's house or a family member or in a crucial situation. And we did it during the winter storms that the, uh, we, would, we would have hotel rooms that would be rented. Uh, as part of the emergency response, and people would, would be provided the opportunity to go to a hotel room for a night or two. So that's kind of that's the new, uh, you know, emerging uh, improvement in terms of how we how we manage when people have to evacuate. How we support that. Knowing where you can go, where you can be safe, is so important. Identify those hotels in advance that can take pets, or if you have, um, you know. Uh, ambulatory issues, you know, uh, hotels that are ground level, you know, call those hotels in advance, those friends and family, make those connections in advance. Because it's a scary thing to have to end up at a TEP and not know, but you guys have the ability to, to figure out where you can go. And if you decide to evacuate somewhere, you're just driving and parking somewhere, make sure you're far enough away, right? So during the Edgewood fire, you know, initially we were sending people up to Kenyatta College. And then we were like, oh, this might not be exactly the best thing. Uh, I believe they have agreements. You have agreements with all the- Yeah, the Department of Emergency Management, uh, San Mateo County's uh, Office of Emergency Services and the Emergency Services Council have agreements with all, all three of the junior colleges in the county, Kenyatta, Skyline, and, and San Mateo, um, to, to utilize their, their facilities as, as temporary evacuation points. That's a, those are good locations in most cases. Except Skyline had a fire, it was a wildland fire uh, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. um, approaching Skyline College. People yeah. were leaving, we can't go there. <laughs> it was like, 
the fire department didn't want to be there on top of the hill. Um, but um, so um, anyway, that, that's that's the, um, the yeah. So one of the things that another back to the zone haven, if you uh, ever ask people to leave a community, you really try to give them a place to go. So all these different places have been identified on zone haven, but they're not community visible. So when an incident does activate, and for, for example, the Edgewood fire, it might think, hey, that might be a good spot to go to Kenyatta College, might be somewhere else. Once we decide where that place is gonna be, go on the backside of a zone haven, and we just hit a little toggle, and it now becomes community visible. And so these arrival points are not just uh, for folks to go, but also uh, we have large animals, and there could be a thing down here as well too. And I didn't know this until uh, recently, but like large animals, you know, it makes sense. Hey, send them all to the cow palace at the CZU fire. That's what we were thinking, but there's different animals, different needs and different places to send them. So as we find out, we work with those groups that handle like the large animal evacuation groups that hey, maybe some of these areas we thought would be good, but maybe they're out of service for one reason or another. Maybe there's a quarantine of after different animals. So the whole point is we don't add those places to be community visible until and once the event kicks off, we make sure that that arrival point, that temporary evacuation point, whatever that might be, is not gonna be somewhere where it's gonna put folks in a spot where they get turned away. So how are you gonna get information right when an incident happens? Everybody wants to know, they, where am I gonna know? How am I gonna find out, right? Uh, you wanna stay on top of it obviously beforehand. You know, on the red flag days, you can just be monitoring the weather. Pulse Point is a great app to have. If you ever hear the sirens drive by and you're like, what was that? If you download Pulse Point on your phone, you can actually see what type of call it is and often listen to radio traffic on there. Um, so uh, P PIOs, public information officers, were utilized during uh, the CZU fire um, to give a briefing every 12 hours. They made a briefing and a uh, press release was um, pushed out and they basically just gave you all the information that they had. And so you may be engaging with a PIO, but you could also be getting information from the temporary evacuation points. We also have social media. Um, we utilize our Instagram uh, for the fire district. We utilize our Instagram. We also have uh, groups.io. So just like PV Forum, um, there are a lot of other community areas around here who have email lists which I'm connected with. So you'll see a notice from me on there if I can put one out, um, just providing information. Also as well, you guys have the AM radio station. Just remember though that that's a pre-recorded message. So somebody has to record that and then put it on the radio. I'm sorry, I think I'm too close to this. Um, and put it on the radio. So uh, it will have, if, if it does have a message, it's gonna be a looped message that just goes over and over. But that is one way we push out information. And then obviously neighborhood networks. This is huge. One person see, sees or smells smoke and then you start calling your phone chain saying, hey, do you see this? Do you know what's going on? Because it could potentially just be a barbecue, right? That's happened a lot. But if not, you're gonna find out quickly from all your neighbors. Everybody's gonna start looking. Everybody's gonna start wondering what's going on. And again, you, that's why it's important for us to be connected with you because you guys could give us that vital information of identifying specifically where that is. So making sure you're connected with your neighbors is huge. As well as bulletin boards, we have, we're such a small town here. So we don't have huge, you know, billboards. We don't have a local uh, news station, right? News channel. Um, our paper is really the almanac, but that's not really our local, local paper. So. You know, we utilize bulletin boards. Um, our online presence is, uh, we try to make it pretty significant now um, in our social media, but we don't really have those big broad channels for us. Where'd he go? <laughs> While she's doing that, I'm gonna scare you. Um, there you go. There's a number of causes for civilian fatalities and wildfires. It's really upset me as a fire professional, how many people have died in evacuations in the last seven or eight years. Never happened before. I mean, it happened occasionally, but um, you know, we, we, had, we had fire in, the deadliest fires in California history, 
top seven uh, have happened since excuse me, top the top seven have happened since nineteen since twenty eighteen. Um, no, I'm, I'm wrong. But anyway. It's a campfire in Butte County, 88 people died. Uh, Santa Rosa in 2017, 25 people died. Sunday night, went to bed, nine o'clock, get it back, told at midnight, get out, you know, get out, go wherever you can. Um, why, do people, why are people dying in, in wildfire? So we did a literature review about these incidents, both in Australia and, and here in Captain America. Three basic factors, extreme, fire behavior conditions. All the fire people will tell you that's a very real thing and completely unprecedented starting in 2015. Failures or delays in alerting, SMC alert, and communication systems. So we just covered all the structured and the casual communication systems that, that people need to be able to um, utilize. Delays in evacuation departure due to late minute, excuse me, last minute evacuations or an inability to evacuate. Uh, very few fatalities occur in enclosed automobiles on unobstructed roadways or in temporary refuge areas. So that's important if you get on the road when you're supposed to. Um, the main contributor to civilian fatalities is delayed evacuation. The rest of learn in both America and, and Australia. Uh, the key insight from the past studies is the importance of age. And I'm 70, so I can, I'm involved in this factor. Most civilian fatalities in the campfire were individuals over 65 years of age who were trapped in their homes or on their properties for reasons including failure to receive alerts and evacuation orders, inability to mobilize due to lack of transportation or health condition, inability to perceive an immediate threat, they saw the smoke, they saw the flames, they saw, but it didn't, didn't register in time for them to actually evacuate safely that they needed to leave. And, or their decision to remain in their home. Um, There's a couple of Democrat, demographic characteristics of those who are more likely to delay evacuation include the elderly, uh, include males, residents who have been living in their homes for 15 years or longer, Never happened here before, not gonna happen now. Disabled residents and those with pets. It should be noted that studies showed households with children were more likely to evacuate immediately. Mm -hmm. Fire departments were thinking of these population subgroups in terms of the capacity to evacuate. So those are up-to-date learned experiences that we're trying to grapple with and, and uh, evolve our uh, emergency management systems and understandings of what we're facing. So that's a good segue into the next two sections that we did because we're running out of time here. But uh, the fire district, along with Brian Kelly and the DEM uh, last year, some of our dedicated residents like Rob Young uh, have been working on, we did work on and came up with a plan for the school district on evacuation guidance. And the, the, the guidance that we came up with and, and the objectives are on this chart that you see right now. And the activity at the top, you can see, I don't know if you guys can see it, but the wildfire activity, in this case, it's a wildfire, but this can be applied to anything. Uh, the, the activity, the description of what's happening during that activity, what the action is in this case for the school, the actions that they take and the communications that are necessary that need to happen. And we came up with four different levels. Level one is a red flag warning. Level two, nearby active wildfire. Level three, evacuation warning. And then level four, an evacuation order or possibly sheltering in place. Uh, and so what, what we came up with here, we feel is a very effective and efficient program. Um, the school's very happy with it. And what we're now going to do is we're gonna do something very similar for the community. We're working on that right now currently. And we're basically gonna have the same four levels, but we're gonna take the objectives that we provided for the schools and we're gonna set those objectives for the community level so that people in the community have something like this that they can be aware of. They can know what the actions are that they're gonna to need to take at each level and what the communication is gonna be and where it's gonna come from when these things happen. Next slide. 
So the flow chart for that would look very similar to what you see on the screen right now. It's a little hard to see. It's, it might be kind of hard to see, but on the top left under a, a red flag warning is issued. You either have a yes answer or a no answer, and that leads you to your next step, depending on if it's a yes or a no. Uh, is there an active wildfire nearby? Yes or no? And it takes you into every direction that you need to go to to determine what your actions are, you know, either as a, uh, a school teacher or uh, a resident in this case when we get done working on the community. So that's some things that, you know, we finished with the school. We're going we're gonna to really try to, to hit the parents up when school begins in September. We had a, a very small showing of parent. Uh, participation at the last meeting that we had. We're hoping to get more participation because it's important for these parents to know what's going to happen during the wildfire and whether they're not going to be able to get their kids, whether they are going to be able to get in and get their kids, whether they're not going to be able to get in and get their kids. And if they're not, what are, what are the processes that we have set in place that they need to trust that we've set the right thing up and then we're going to take care of getting them. And the fact also that the school has been hardened. I walked around, you know, they did, they're doing construction right now on Puerto Madera School in Ormondale. We've mitigated the vegetation around both schools to provide for this. We've also walked around since they're doing the construction. I've uh, recommended what they need to do to make sure that these buildings are hardened. So in the case that we can't get these kids out, at least we have someplace safe where we can uh, shelter them in place. Yeah, that's it for the slide. All done? All done. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> we got a whole bunch we, more. Oh, yeah. No, no. There's, <laughs> if nobody else has questions, I always have questions. The old reporter here. But uh, we do have some pre-questions from folks. Um, go ahead. You're here first. Come up to the podium. Give your name and ask your question. Hi, my name is Liz. And my question is regarding the sequoias. I have two relatives that live there and I'm extremely concerned about their ac evacuation um, plans. I wanna call it that. For example, my father tells me that they have been told to drive to the town center. That doesn't seem far enough away for me. I don't understand why they would all stop at the town center. And I would like to know if the fire department has plans to work with Sequoias like it that did with the school district to really make sure that they know what they're doing. And particularly, we heard that studies show that elderly people over 70 or 75, whatever it was, are key people at risk. And here we have over 300 of them in one small space. And that's part of Portola Valley. So I was wondering if it's going to be a special focus for the fire department versus just community. Okay, great. I, well, I hear a couple questions in there. Uh, one is, does the fire district work with the Sequoias? And the answer to that is yes, we do. The Sequoias has their own emergency plan that they have. Uh, we've worked with them. We understand what that plan is. The Sequoias has a plan where they can have buses come in and they can take these residents outside of the area and bring them to what we talked about earlier would be temporary evacuation points. And that's where they would take them. They wouldn't take them to the town center. It's too close. So I don't, I don't know where that information is coming from, but that isn't that isn't part of the plan. I can add. They've also <clears throat> are working on a plan to shelter in place. Yeah. Right. I was going to get into that too. So the sec and then that was the second part of the question that I heard. I have walked around with the sequoias and looked at all of their buildings, and I've made recommendations to them on on the on the vulnerabilities that I saw on their buildings, and I provided them the solutions on how they can try to increase the survivability of people who have to take shelter in those buildings. And I can assure you that there are many of those buildings there are good shelter in place buildings. They have stucco on the outside. They changed the roof. They used to have wood shake roofs on those buildings. Yeah. So they've changed the roof. They now have comp roofs. Mm -hmm. I've made suggestions about their vents. They have gave big, large gable end vents on the ends that uh, the screening should have been much tighter than what it was. And uh, so they've had all the recommendations from the fire district. I've walked around, I've looked at it, and uh, they've made a lot of those recommendations too. And currently, right now, what they're working on is, uh, well, the fire district's working on some new ordinance that's 
ordinances that, that are not going to allow some vegetation to be within the five foot footprint of the building. And the sequoias is already on top of that. It sounds like it might be advantageous to everybody if there were a seminar at the sequoias with you guys to talk about, guys and gals, to talk about uh, what is happening because I know I have a dear friend there, but they for, my friend forgets sometimes. And uh, mm. But it would be good just to know that that is in process and that they are going to be safe because that's a real fear that a lot of your folks have there. Absolutely. Uh, we we held a, a panel there. We usually do we, it every year. Yeah, they invite the us to. They but... invite us to come out every year and we do it for them. And it's usually yeah. right, either right before or right during when fire season. Yeah, this but you're right. It's a... every year, you know, should be reminded, you know, people, because also two plants change. And also with all the upgrades they're doing, it is, right. it's great to just stay on top of it. I'm curious though, can you, is there anyone from the state that looks after a retirement home or whatever to mandate certain things that are the minimum that are required for evacuations? Because I know in some of the North Bay fires, there were lots of problems with evacuating hospitals and home care facilities and uh, a lot of criticism there. So do you actually have any real oomph to force? some things to be done? If there were um, some kind of legislation or some kind of group from the state that did that, um, I think that we would. There, I, there isn't any that I know of, although they did just start a new uh, wildfire mitigation division at the state level through CAL FIRE. And that's something that we could look into to see if they're, if they're going to provide that kind of services where they could come out and talk about the event. Sounds like maybe with licensing that there should be some minimal requirements for evacuations for dangers like this. Well, I think you asked about the, the Santa Rosa um, fire and um, the Tubbs fire. Right. There was a, a, a Atari was the name of the, the vendor. Right. Who ran, ran the home. They were required to have two uh, full-time staff members who were capable of assisting in evacuation. They didn't have them. Right. They didn't have a, a half hour after the fire started. Ouch. The people, so 28 people were evacuated by their, their loved ones who went on their own to see if they were being taken care of. It took them an hour and a half to get a bus there. So in the interim, three residents, uh, family members were driving a van back and wow. forth um, to get them out, out of harm's way. And as they were taking the last people out, the buildings were burning. And they had the last uh, 15 people or 12 people, they got them onto a bus. But it was right. I remember covering that. That's why I brought it up hours? because it, you, two hours? Of an hour and a half to get the bus. At, at, I mean, you can have the, the best bus. plan, but if it's not feasible yeah. to get a bus up there in 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I'm just saying, you know, it seems like um, a potential issue there that somebody might want to. But, keep uh, rest homes, I call them rest homes, but uh, uh, care homes. Are required to have a certain number of staff people on all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have nurses on. Those guys back there are the nurses sometimes. Yep. Um, you know, it, it's a big deal to, for for the, the EMS system to cover cover the needs in those, those facilities. Um, one question that I know I've encountered and know the answer to, but some folks want to know if you can force them to evacuate. You talking about the sequoias? Because no, the, I'm no, talking about general. regular in folks general, that yeah, you talked about. Yeah, no. No, cannot, no. cannot make you leave. Right. But once you leave, you cannot come back. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I cannot make you leave. If you I make a decision jump. that you want to stay. Then I can jump into from an LE point of view. We can't make you leave. You know, we can tell you to leave. It's a good idea to leave. But at the end of the day, we're not forcing you out. We're not pulling you. So we, we can't make you leave. But at the same time, you have to tell them that you're not going to station a unit there to watch them to save their life because you've got to then go on. Right. So um, right. we're know. telling we're telling people, hey, we're evacuating this area. We're going yeah. door to door. It's time to leave, but yeah. we're not pulling them out either. So go ahead.
we've already determined that's not true. That was a question that came up during our evacuation meetings. Yeah. And there we looked and there there aren't any dimensions. They're, yeah. not, they're not describing it and they're not telling you. They just say it's very general. It's a, a large open area. Yeah. That's basically. The literature review said you know, very, very seldom do people are people um, killed in who have gone to a temporary refuge area as they were so people are, are evacuating and if the road is blocked or whatever reason, you know, the fire continues the road the actions, you know, we want people to, to, to identify from where they live to where they need to go to be safe. See, in this case, would downtown Redwood City. You know, that in that route, you, you identify um, areas where if you, if you get stuck, where can we go to be safe? So you're lucky here in Portola Valley, I think, there's a lot of horse, Horses eat eat the grass and stop the stuff they don't eat, and so mm -hmm. that's an example. Mm -hmm. Like in an emergency, where can you go? In Paradise, they had people whose cars were, were stuck on the road. They uh, police sergeants and a battalion chief in two different instances took people out of the cars, got them. One sergeant took them to a parking lot mm -hmm. in front of a Starbucks, roughly, and they sat down and waited for the fire to blow through. Now he said he made a real bad decision. He didn't know it, but they both. Had a situation happen. There were uh, propane storage facilities right behind the building they were evacuated in front of, but they all survived that. Even they all they survived died. it. Wow. So, a open area uh, that, in, in, as part of the incident management, if we knew people were at a certain location, we had identified uh, temporary refuge areas. That's part of what will be part of the plan that day is you know, we need to make sure we have somebody some units available to go and protect people in those situations um in the yeah so and at the at the yeah, at the time that it was happening the you know he became kind of the the by default he became the leader of this group that he led into this area and they asked him, they said, are we going to survive this? He says, I have no idea. I've never done it before. He's never done it. And so, you know, if you see an open field and you think, and you think it's looking really dangerous ahead of you, I would say it's probably a pretty good idea to get into that field. And then people have asked, well, should I be on the outside of the field? You know, uh, where should I be? It's like, go where you feel safe and where you feel comfortable. If you feel too much heat over here, I'm pretty sure you're going to move to the middle of the field. And that's the other thing, when you're sheltering in place in your home, shouldn't you be doing some things like filling your bathtub perhaps, or putting uh, wet towels under the doors or something to survive if it comes over you? Yeah, that, that has been brought up before in the past. And the reason for filling the bathtubs with water and filling the sinks with water is if you lose your water supply yeah. due to you know, maybe a main breaking and you, you no longer have a supply of water coming to the house and you've had the shelter in place at the house, at least this way, if it's a vegetation fire and it's blown over and it's gone through, you, you can use buckets, cups of water, whatever you need to, to put out spot fires on the house to, to try to, to save yourself, to save your property. Don't you advise not wetting down your house and staying behind? Uh, because you affect water pressure sometimes, and that that's not a good idea. So it's better to get out of there and let you guys do it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we it, always advise to leave. To never stay. Behind. Yeah. To you never should stay always behind. leave, and you you should all if if you get nothing else out of this day today, the one thing you should walk away with is be prepared and always leave early. Mm -hmm. That's the one. I my son, I mentioned in working with lots of fire victims, most of them say couple of things that they learned. One, they wish they had left earlier. And two, whenever it goes to even a warning that the first thing you should do is corral your pets because pets get a little scared when yeah. they start smelling or seeing the fire and it's harder to corral them. And some of them have had their pets either die or they died from one in their family trying to save a pet. 
So getting your pets together as well as your other belongings, but getting out of there yeah. and get out as soon as you can. And we, I know in this town, we still have some issues going about having two routes of evacuation and, and potentially more houses built and more things going and just how we would everybody get out of town. And so I think it's incumbent on us to really leave as early as you possibly can. I do want to mention too, the thing with pets is if when you set your plan in place, you want them to get used to whatever it is you're going to be putting them into any type of, um, you know, harness or leash or uh, carrier, because it's going to put a large amount of stress on them. So if you do it in advance, so they're at least comfortable with it, it's going to be easier for, for both of you. I want to talk real quick about the evacuation routes you mentioned. So uh, the um, Emergency Services Council authorized the Department of Emergency Management to send out an RFP to hire a firm to do an evacuation route assessment of the entire county. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to identify all the major, identify the major evacuation routes for sure, but also every, by state law now, all our safety plans in the cities have to identify any. Um, dead end, so any place you see a cul-de-sac or a dead end street, you identify those at, at, and have, have that um, identified in your city uh, or county emergency plan so that we can identify that as part of our emergency um, response. Uh, needs. But, and it's also intended that in, in the future that to have the communities somehow, you know, as their communities either develop or they have a chance to alter or improve the evacuation routes they are identified and codified so um, that we, we have that uh, we have two vendors who applied uh, who submitted proposals and we'll hope to have that done within the next 12 months that complete assessment of the county that will be a planning tool it doesn't solve anything yet but identifies the most critical evacuation routes and in those that it's one of the um, California wildfire and forest resiliency action plan from 2021 was to create fire safe roadways. Um, a fire safe roadway is, a, is vital to reducing wildfire in, uh, ignition, ignitions because cars start a lot of fire on the side of the roads um, and ensuring emergency route um, access during emergencies. So. Um, our time is officially up, but um, something came up in some of our earlier meetings. And since we have this, celebrated group up here. If I could take one moment to ask you a couple of questions because many of us have gotten our great Woodside Fire Protection District uh, brochures and also our notices about inspections on our homes for fire mitigation and fire risk. Um, and so there were questions as to um, how extensive those would be, whether they would be shared with insurance companies. I know it says they would be put in a folder just for you, the homeowner, but there was some concern there. And the other question is mine, if you do these inspections, will you be noting on particular houses or if you keep such records to say that this house has a pool with fire with water that is potentially helpful in a wildland fire or that they have gates that let you go from one street to another like our house you could go from one street to another if you're blocked um, but it's not visible I mean it's not open all the time but it's easy to open from the inside things like that that would be helpful during an actual fire if you actually go that detailed to know house by house or somebody has an AED or something. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I can answer that. I wrote the letter and sent it out. So I'd probably okay. be the right person to ask. <laughs> I kind of thought so. Yeah, um, so let's go back. There was a, quite a few questions in there, but first off, uh, what are you, how extensive do you need to go? So we talk about two things in the letter. We talk about home hardening items and we talk about the principal space. Home hardening right now is those are recommendations. So those aren't, you don't have to comply with those. Those are recommendations. A lot of times we highly recommend that you do these things because they will increase the survivability of the home in the neighborhood. Okay. As far as the defensible space goes, we like to look at the three home ignition zones. 
So zone zero, which is zero to five feet from the foundation of the footprint of the home. And then from there, it goes five to 30 and then 30 out to 100 feet, if you have it, or to the property. And so currently during, you know, in that zero to five feet zone, it is, uh, we do not want any flammable mulches. You cannot have any hazardous fuels. That means dry, tall grasses. Those need to be cut to less than three inches in height. Um, you cannot have any uh, flammable brush that's non-irrigated in that zero to five feet. You can have plants in that zero to five feet. We don't recommend that you put them in front of windows or next to wood siding, mm -hmm. but that's up to you, right? You know, you can have the plants in there. We are currently writing a more stringent ordinance that'll be coming out in the next 60 days. And uh, we will be apprising the community of what that entails. And, you know, we're talking about how to roll that out to the community so that we can do it you know, in a kind of a step-by-step -step, this year, you'll be responsible for this and then it's gonna increase the following year. But you'll be looking for those items when you inspect each well, one. We will be looking for the, the regular defensible space items, the hazardous fuels that are too close to the house, branches that are touching the roof that need to be lifted so that there's a six foot clearance between the roof and the branches so that you don't bring fire to the house. And you have 30 days in which well, from the initial inspection, we give you 30 days to correct any violations that we see, right. violations of the fire code. We will make recommendations on that inspection for you, the homeowner, to try to increase the survivability of your home by identifying what those vulnerabilities are. But we're only going to be writing violations for fire code sections that come up. Let's say you cannot do this. And some folks ask questions today about their neighbors. Maybe they've done mitigation, but their neighbor hasn't. And I said, this was a good, um, that if you're checking every home, then your neighbor's getting this too, and they know that they're a hazard, and you don't have to go and tell them. To also, well, this is also <laughs> the time of year where we get a lot of phone yeah. calls from neighbors. Oh, do you really? Yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> so. which is fine. I mean, sometimes, you know, we, we don't, we have it, we missed a house or missed a property. And, you know, you may feel like, oh, you know, I'm doing something bad by tattling on it. But no, you're just giving us information so that we can make it safer. And I just wanted to mention something about the pool situation, right? So we did have a program, a pool pump program, where we uh, cataloged all the pool pumps in the district. We would come out and help service them for you. Um, so that that also gave us information. And then the gate, situation, if it's on your private property, we may not be aware of it, but if there are several gates throughout the district that we would, we've opened during like the severe yeah. winter weather, sure. but in terms of you and your neighborhood, that is crucial information you should be sharing with your neighbors, getting together and saying, hey, in the event of a fire, you, you guys, we can't get out our normal way. Hey, so-and-so has a gate that can be opened up you know, so that's information that maybe not everybody in the district needs, but you and your neighbors immediately need. And we may not be able to pull that information up immediately to get it to you. So again, it lies back on you. And we don't share this information with insurance companies. They don't ask us, they don't ask us for it and we don't share it. They, they definitely have their own means of collecting their information, but we are using an electronic app now that does collect a lot of data on every property. And it's important data for us as first responders. We can, we can now identify who has propane tanks and how big are they on the property? Who has a swimming pool? Maybe we didn't have that in our pre-plans. We now have the ability to collect that data and put it into our pre-plans so that we know if somebody has a swimming pool and they're not aware of our pool pump program, we can reach out to them and tell them, hey, look, you got a pool. This is gonna help increase the survivability of your home. It allows firefighters to come in with portable pumps or if you have the pump, we, we ask them to provide it. And we know by a blue dot that's on their mailbox that these people have a pool and a pool pump. So Great. It's good that, you know, we're going to be able to collect a lot of data that's going to help us with our, with our response. And maybe a good way to end this is with a pitch and uh, um, for Woodside Fire and for all of you folks, the job you do, number one, we thank you. Um, you're invaluable all the time, but especially if we have the worst incidents around here. Um, but the other is that this is a great time for the seminar because 
next weekend, we have cleanup day in Portola Valley. And I don't know about others, but I've got a whole pile. I even hired somebody to bring a truck and we're loading on Friday to dump on Saturday before hopefully you come to look at our house. And uh, then the chipper service starts in our neighborhood on May 1st. And so if you have a lot of limbs or trees that came down during the storm or that you're doing for mitigation, we have the chippers coming around in the next few months. So we have some real incentive plus as you were, if you were here this morning on the fire department, I mean the uh, Department of Insurance, you now can get breaks. Uh, I would wait another month or two to really see it happen because right now 40% of the insurers in the state uh, are using the new guidelines where they have to give you discounts for certain mitigation that you've done on your property and they have to, it now has to be transparent. They have to explain it to you and why they've given you the fire rating that they've given, not based on CAL FIRE maps, but on their own way of doing this. But um, the insurance companies just had to submit their rates to the Department of Insurance by the 15th of May. So right now for the next two months, the Department of Insurance is going through those before they'll all hopefully start taking effect. And uh, I read something in insurance industry um, newsletter yesterday preparing for this that said insurance companies are betting that most of us will not do mitigation uh -huh. and therefore they will make more money here because they won't have to give the discounts. I think we're going to show them in this town that we are willing to do the work and get the lower rates and save lives and save homes. And thank you all for what you do to yeah. do that. For Definitely. Us. Also, too, be aware of your chipper date and please do not set your piles out more than two weeks in advance because that creates a fire hazard. So please, please, Danny is here. So um, please follow the guidelines. We ask for the chipper program. We are so happy to offer it to you. Take advantage of it. But don't create a problem for us. In we are, we're doing something a little different this year, too. We're trying to get our inspectors into the areas where they're going to be chipping oh. ahead of time so that, you know, people understand what it is that needs to be done on the property, knowing that in a few weeks they can get it chipped for free if they just get the work done. So, oh, great. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you all for being here. And a big shout, shout out to the Wildfire Preparedness Committee that put on this yes. whole day and organized all this. And I just got to be up front and do the easy part. So oh, no, thank you yeah, all. You were magnificent. Yeah, yeah, I'm you. so glad you volunteered to do this. Volunteered. Uh, that's <laughs> loose there. <laughs> MJ, yeah. MJ volunteered me, I'm afraid. Hey. 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 Hey.
That's very good. That's very good feedback. 